Last year, my husband and I decided to clean out our attic, which was in our two-story home. It was long overdue, and none of us had been up there in over a year. The attic wasn't very big, and neither of us used it. However, we did have some things up there that had been stored up there for years. We finally decided that the space could be put to better use. We both went up there one Saturday morning and looked inside. There were a few boxes and old pieces of furniture. It really wasn't that bad. We grabbed a couple of boxes and brought them down. I asked my husband to go through one of the boxes because it was mainly his things in there. Then I went back up to get some more. When I went back up, I got a couple more boxes. But as I was up there, I thought that I heard a noise come from the back corner of the attic. I looked but I saw nothing. Nevertheless, I was pretty freaked out and ran back downstairs. My husband asked me what the problem was, and I told him I heard a noise up there. We both decided to go back up together and investigate. When we got up there, everything seemed normal, and I walked over to the corner where I had heard the noise. My husband followed to look, but just then, we both heard a noise from directly behind us where the door was. We turned around at the same time to see the door to the attic being slammed shut. It was so fast I didn't see who had shut the door, but it was now closed. My husband and I both looked at each other in shock. Who just did that, he asked. He then walked over to the door to open it, but the doorknob had been broken off from the inside. We both tried to get out, but couldn't seem to open the door with no knob on it. We heard some movement throughout the rest of our house as we did. It was very creepy, and luckily we did have our phones on us, so I decided to call the police. My husband then put a large piece of furniture in front of the door, so whoever was in our house could at least not get back in the attic where we were. I explained the situation to the police, and they said they would arrive shortly. We waited, and looked out our window as well as listened to hear for more noises in the rest of our house. We didn't really hear anything more though as we waited. We looked around the attic, but didn't see any evidence to indicate that someone had been up there. Several minutes later, we saw out the window the police arriving in our driveway, and we waved out to them. They made their way into the house and up to the attic when they opened the door for us. They told us whoever had been in our house was now gone. Our back door had been left open, and they didn't find anybody inside. Whoever it was didn't appear to take anything or mess up the house at all, which was a little bit surprising to me. We were able to finish cleaning out the attic and replace the doorknob in the days after, we didn't know how the person got into our attic in the first place, or what they wanted, but I also found it creepy how they knew to remove the doorknob so we couldn't get out. This story happened last spring. I was doing some spring cleaning in my house like I did every year. As soon as the weather would get warm, I would organize through things and then have a big yard sale. I went through many things around the house and then took out several boxes of things we were selling outside because it was such a nice day out. Once we had everything outside, we would organize it and decide how much we would charge for it at our yard sale. I was cleaning by myself on this day and went through quite a few things and had a decent number of boxes outside by the time I had been cleaning for a few hours. When I was on my way out to the driveway to put some more things out, I saw a man walking up my driveway and towards my garage. We had a detached garage which was open at the time, and I didn't recognize this man at all. It was really unusual for something like this to happen, and I called out to the man and asked him what he was doing. But he didn't answer me, he just kept walking until he was inside of my garage. Now I was a little bit worried, because we had tools and other things in there he could steal, or even use as a weapon. Still, I decided to follow the man inside and hoped that he didn't have any bad intentions. Maybe he just thought he was at another house or something. I walked over to the garage and went inside. When I got inside, I couldn't find him. I walked all around, which wasn't that big, just a single car garage, and we didn't have a car in there at the time. I walked around it twice, but never saw the man. Other than the large garage door in front, we only had one other door in the back of the garage, but it was covered at the time by our old trash cans. I just didn't see how on earth the man could go and just seemingly disappear like that. I was a little bit spooked, and then went back and decided to bring the boxes just inside my house. I organized the rest of the things as usual, and on the next day set up for our yard sale. I planned to have part of the sale in our garage and the rest in our driveway. As I was setting up things in the garage, I couldn't help but feel a little creeped out by remembering the man who seemingly vanished in there the day before. 
The next day, we held our yard sale. I sat about midway down the driveway at a table and chair with a little cash register, and before long, people started to show up. Things were going well until one of the shoppers came up to me. She told me that there was a creepy man hiding in a garbage can in the garage. I decided to go over and look. I felt more brave with a few people being around, and when I got to the garbage can in the garage, I opened it up and saw the same man from before. He didn't look at me, but aggressively jumped out and sprinted away. Everyone seemed really surprised at what they had seen. I'm really glad the man didn't cause any major problems, but it's really creepy to think how he was likely in my garage for several days. Several years back, I was cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and moving my stuff to my next place. The house that I had at the time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing I had in them. One of them I opened up, and I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag. I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine, but when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sorted by the sink, and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside and had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw there was a small trap door to the side leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it, and I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late, and the next day after work I continued. I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house, and decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet and went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw movement and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me, and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long the person was living in my secret room, but thankfully it never gave me a problem. Back when we moved into our house, we were introduced to all of our neighbors by them coming to our house with cookies or brownies, kind of like they do in the movies. This was a nice, quiet, middle-class neighborhood, made up of mostly older white people and new families. I mention that because we were the only black family in the neighborhood. No black wives, husbands, not even adopted children. We didn't really find it strange, though. It was just very clear that we were different. I was about 13 years old at the time, and my brother was 15. Our backyard was about a half an acre and is fenced, but it's also connected to two other houses' backyards. Each one is about half the size of ours, but we all have separating fences. So to paint a picture, there's a T-shaped fence separating our backyards. The house to the left was the home of an older man named Tom. He kind of reminded me of Willie Nelson, but without the cool pigtails. He liked to be outside shirtless and usually with a denim vest, no matter what the weather was. He was a pretty well-built man, but visibly kind of frail. We actually found him to be quite funny, in a creepy old guy type of way. As I got older, he had started to make comments. 
I played in the backyard with my dogs a lot, and Tom could see me in his living room window that faced his backyard. Whenever I glanced over, I could always see him in the window just standing there watching me. When he noticed that I saw him, he'd come out and talk to me. I would try to get away before he would come out, but sometimes I was just too slow. I didn't want to make it too obvious, so I would just walk. But if I didn't make it inside, he'd yell for me to come back. I never got too close to the fence, though. I'd speak from a distance. He would ask me about school, what grade I was in, tell me I was pretty, and ask if I was old enough to have a boyfriend. Also, if I had an older sister or older friends that looked like me. It was pretty weird, but I'd just laugh it off. But after a few questions, he'd stop talking to me and just stare at me, silently. I would always give an excuse about needing to go inside, and he would nod and stand at the fence and just watch me walk back into the house. This kind of thing happened almost weekly. My mom really loves to decorate, so she changes the house decor every few months or so. It's pretty annoying, actually. During one of her designing sprees, she had decided to get a new sliding glass door for the back porch, which required her to take the curtains down in the living room. It took forever to get them installed, but she figured that there was no point in putting the curtains back up if we'd have to take them back down again. Fine, I guess. Now, our family TV was in the living room. I didn't have a TV in my room, so I'd often watch TV late into the night in the living room with my brother. One night, my brother went to bed pretty early, so I decided to watch TV by myself that night. Right around midnight or so, I had turned off the TV so I could go to bed. I got up from the couch, turned off the light, and then turned around to see another light on. Not in my house, but in Tom's house. It was in his living room, and he was there, just standing in the window watching me. I later told my parents about it, but they just shrugged it off. I'm a pretty anxious soul, so I often just chalk things up to my anxiety. Fine. Not too long afterwards, though, my dogs had started to get sick. I would take them out to play and they'd start throwing up or have diarrhea. We knew that it wasn't their food because we didn't give them anything new. We also threw away the dog treats that we recently bought just in case that was the problem. But it didn't stop. I had started to notice that every time I let them out alone, they'd always run straight over Tom's fence jumping up and down and wagging their tails. He would slowly walk outside, reach over the fence, and then feed them his treats, which was really odd because Tom didn't even have a dog. I told my parents, and my dad went to talk to him, telling him the dogs were getting sick. Tom had apologized, and he had also stopped feeding them, and they got better. A few weeks later, I was coming home from school. My brother was in the grade above me, and I was a senior, so he was in college at the time. Whenever I got home, no one else would be home for a few more hours. I had a routine. I would put my book bag downstairs, then change clothes, let the dogs out of their cages on the porch, get a snack, and then let them back in. For some strange reason, I was just unusually excited to see my dogs that day. So instead of going upstairs, I went straight to the back porch. I had got to the door to open it, and I then saw Tom just sitting on the ground right in front of the dogs' cages. I froze. He didn't see me, though. I looked over to see if the door was locked, but it wasn't. I began to lock it as slowly as possible so it didn't make a noise, but it did. Tom then looked over and he saw me standing there. I ran upstairs to go call my parents. My mom's a nurse, so she didn't have her phone on, and my dad, well, my dad just never answered the phone. I didn't really think that it was serious enough to call the police, so instead I just hid. After about a moment though, I had then heard Tom knock on the door. It wasn't loud or aggressive though. It was almost like friendly, like he just wanted to talk. I tried my dad's phone yet again and he then answered. I was crying hysterically and I had then told him that Tom was on the porch. He said he'd head home but he was about an hour away. I just sat in my room, just waiting for my dad. The knocking stopped. All I remember was that my dad got home and Tom was gone. I don't really know what happened between Tom and my dad, but he did stop coming outside and talking to me. He never did stop watching, though. 
always standing in his living room. Sometimes I'd see him through the window and he would wave at me, but always with the light on, just so I knew that he was still there. It was pretty creepy. I'm a 21-year-old female, so I just recently moved into my first apartment. My neighbors are all really nice. I was actually introduced to them the day I moved in about three weeks ago. One of my neighbors is this guy named Paul. Paul stays outside most of the time, and he like always wants to talk. Now, I'm not too social. I'm totally fine with talking to people and having long conversations. But when I'm at home, I really just want to be inside with my pets and watching X-Files. Paul always talks to me like every second that he has the chance, knocking on my door to ask me something or inviting me over to chat like last week. Soon after I moved in, Paul had gave me his Wi-Fi password so that I could use it for my TV. He asked me for my phone number to send the photo of his internet box because the password's just a bunch of numbers and letters all jumbled up. I gave him my number and it was whatever. We never sent any texts apart from that photo. Then today, I had got a series of texts, saying that I have a secret admirer and that he wants to stay anonymous until we see where things go. At first, I just ignore it. That is, until he then uses my name and then says, Talk to me, yes or no. So now I'm totally freaked out. I entertain the text, answering simply and just trying to find out who it is. He asked me for my preferences, my type, and my age preference. Pretty mildly weird and unsettling since he absolutely refuses to tell me who he is. Later on in the text, he says that we should have a secret affair, not tell anyone. He says that he's in his 40s and that we should sleep together and that he'll always support me financially. There's only one person in their 40s that has my number. My neighbor. My neighbor Paul, who's always outside talking to me any chance he gets and constantly staring at me. I tell him that I'm pretty positive that I know who he is, but he just insists that I don't. There's no coincidence in the fact that I got his text not even two weeks later after giving him my number. He says that he could have gotten it from a coworker. Now, I work in a hospital, but in my department there's only five guys, but not a single one of my coworkers even have my number. So anyway, yeah. Now I have a creepy neighbor who propositioned me for sex in return for money, and I'm pretty much stuck here in a year lease, living about 10 feet away from him. So great. This event occurred when I was a child. I was around 8 years old at the time. My mom, my sister, and I had just moved into a new apartment complex, and we were really happy to finally have moved in, and everything was going pretty fine. My younger sister and I would always play outside almost every day, and soon enough, we had met our neighbor. He was really nice to us and would often give us candy and ice cream, but always told us not to ever tell our mom, which at the time, I didn't really give much thought to. We would sit outside and eat whatever treat he had given us that day, and then he would collect our trash, which we thought was really nice of him. He would always stare at us with a really creepy smile on his face and I remember feeling really uncomfortable with it. On one day, my family was getting ready to go somewhere, and while my mom was getting ready, my sister and I just went outside to play. After some time, we had heard a whisper coming from upstairs. It was our neighbor, and he was poking his head out of his front door. He then said, Hey girls, I've got some candy, but if you really want it, you're going to have to come up here to get it. My sister and I, being really naive children, got really excited, and we started to walk up the stairs to his apartment. While we ascended up the stairs, he had a really wild smile and a finger up to his mouth, like he was motioning us to be quiet. We were about halfway up the stairs when my mom then came out and told us to come back down. Then the man immediately closed his door. After that happened, my mom wouldn't let us go outside alone anymore, and our neighbor stopped talking to us completely. Looking back on this, I was so foolish to take things from a man that I barely even knew. If my mom wouldn't have called out to us, who knows what would have happened to me and my sister. Not too long after, we had moved to a different location. To that really creepy man that almost successfully lured us into his home. I'm really glad you didn't succeed. When I was 11, almost 12... 
there was this woman living above me that was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she had went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This happened in 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception than a rule, at least for my area. For a little context, I was home alone at the time while my mom was at work about a five minute walk away. My mom had let our neighbor and her boyfriend come to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and just let him in, bringing him into the living room which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits for a few seconds, then hangs up the phone. He does this a couple more times before the front door of the building then opens. Now, you can easily hear the front door open from where we were. It's a heavy door and the walls are really thin. And the way that our building is set up, it's a really small, old single family house converted into apartments. Me and my mom's apartment was the only one on the first floor, and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was literally the only one above us. Kind of irrelevant, but there was also a much smaller apartment below us. Anyways, my neighbor's boyfriend then looked at me pointing his finger right up to his lips, as if he was trying to shush me or something. He then went on to tell me not to tell anyone he was there, before then speed walking to my room right at the other end of the apartment. I then watched my bedroom door then close, right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock right on the door. My jaw then dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. The cop had then asked me if my neighbor's boyfriend was there. Being really scared, I had stammered out, yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, which I agreed to, and as he was coming in, he asked if I could let his partner in the back door and lead them to my room. We started to walk together to the back of the apartment so that I could let his partner in. Now, the back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. After I let them into my room, I had then watched as they then pulled my neighbor's boyfriend right out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, they had told me to go wait in the living room while they had then brought him to the back door. I walked back to the living room and after they closed the door, I couldn't really hear what they were saying but I could then hear the distinct sound of metal clicking and I quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still pretty scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked and locking the front door on my way out. I decided to head to my mom's work, now crying. I'm pretty sure I cut the five minute trip into about two minutes and I've never been a fast runner in my life. I was pretty much fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point and I just really wanted my mom. When I told her what happened, my mom was so pissed off that he had used me in the way that he did, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet of all places and trying to keep the cops from finding him there. She gave me a pretty short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone, telling me that I wasn't to let people use our phone even if I knew them unless she was home. I don't really want to know exactly what he was wanted for, nor do I want to know what would have happened if the cops hadn't shown up when they did. To start off this story, I was a really naive teenager and the first 12 or 13 years of my life were very sheltered. I grew up in a small town community and I actually attended schools that had fewer than 100 students. We moved when I was about 14 to a larger urban area and at that new house was where I had then met the neighbor in question. I didn't really realize it until recently when I really thought about that period of my life that he was trying to groom me. I really could have been a potential victim of his. It's been about 12 years since then and I've now just realized what he was trying to do. When I was about 14 we had moved, packed up our lives and just moved. We moved into a pretty quiet cul-de-sac and I had attended the local school. My mom found a new job and she worked a lot so she was out of the house quite a bit. I had an older brother but he was about 20 years old and always partying out and staying at other people's houses so I saw him even less than I did my mom. I met the creepy neighbor the day after we moved in. He lived about three houses down from us and because it was a sleepy cul-de-sac, he had seen the comings and goings of the cars and moving trucks. He came over and introduced himself and then presented my mom with a dish of lasagna and asked if there was anything he could do to help us. 
Normally my mom is actually quite wary of new people, and she's really been burned by users and abusers in the past, but she seems pretty comfortable around the neighbor, and he did very much put her at ease, even making her smile and laugh. He helped us with some of the larger items of furniture, and he even gave my mom the contact information for the local plumbers and electricians should we need them. He had also told us which were the best companies in town for the internet, things like that. In short, he was very friendly and helpful, always going out of his way to make sure we were settled in. At first, he kept to himself. We didn't really see him in the first three months. If I ever walked past and he was in his garden, then of course I would stop by and say hello. He would ask me a lot of questions. He asked about school, my friends, which teachers I liked, which I didn't like, and he also asked me which subjects I liked and if I had homework. Again, I didn't really read too much into this. He was just being polite and neighborly. He had figured out my mom's work pattern and that I was home alone a lot after school. Then he became even bolder. One day I was walking home and it was after four and I had volleyball practice. He was out in his garden. It was a really hot day that day and he said hello to me and asked me about school. He asked if I had enjoyed practice that day. Then he invited me inside for a glass of lemonade. I told him that I needed to get home and go and get dinner started so that my mom had something to eat when she finished in a few hours. He told me that it was just a glass of lemonade and I really didn't have anything to worry about. Long story short, most weeks after practice I'd always have something to drink with him. He was really easy to talk to and really friendly. He wasn't like any of the other grown ups in my life. Looking back on it now, it seemed that it was really easy to relate to him in a way. He wasn't trying too hard to be cool, but he really seemed to trust my intelligence in a way that no other adult would. He wasn't condescending and he wasn't a rule enforcer like all of the other teachers or adults in my life. He also started dropping by the house a bit too. On the odd chance that my mom had gotten off work early or if it was her day off, then he wouldn't. And if my brother was home, then again, not a peep out of him. But if it was the evening and I was home alone, that on most days he would definitely come by. He was quite a good gardener so he'd ask what had been left for me to start dinner with and he'd always give me tips or sometimes he'd go to his garden and pick me some herbs to go into the meal. He would also pick me flowers from his garden. Every time I thanked him he would always say something along the lines of That's what friends are for. Or You deserve flowers. You worked so hard in school. One time he even said to me Pretty flowers for a pretty girl. That one washed right over me. I thanked him and put the flowers in a vase, not really thinking too much into it at all. Somehow, he had then found out it was my birthday, and so about two days after, when I was once more home alone, he had came by and gave me a silver bracelet. When I told him I couldn't accept it, he then shushed me and then said, Nonsense. Don't think anything of it. Then he told me that it could be our fun little secret and that I could only wear it when no one else was around. It could be our fun little thing and I could always think of him when I'm wearing it. Again, despite the fact that there were all these red flags, I just didn't really think too much into it. He was the neighbor and he was being a friend and keeping an eye on me because he knew I was home alone a lot. He very much wanted me to believe that I could trust him and view him as this protector who I could always go to if I ever needed something. I got a few more gifts from him over time, and again, I was always told that it was our little secret, and that no one else ever needed to know and that they wouldn't understand the dynamics of our friendship. After all, you wouldn't want to get the both of us in trouble, he told me. And he was right, I didn't. Then out of nowhere, one day he had hugged me. I had quickly gone over to his house to help with some odd job, and he hugged me. I'm also almost certain that he also sniffed my hair, but I can't really remember. I remember feeling like it wasn't right. By that point, I think I was about 16, almost 17, and we had been friends for about two years now. He tried to convince me to stay even longer, and I really remember having to literally spell it out to him that I had to get home. I ran the very short distance home, and I must have looked out of sorts, because my brother who was home for once had actually asked me what was wrong. I didn't tell him about the neighbor. I just made up some bullcrap story about the neighborhood kids and them being rude and bullying me. So luckily the next few times I went out, he was always there to protect me. He wouldn't let me out of the house without him. 
I think that he sensed that I was really scared. The neighbors seeing us always together and that my brother was actually home for a change had backed right off. We had moved about two months later. My mom got a better job and we could afford a nicer house in a nicer area, so we then moved. I shudder to think about what would have happened if I stayed on the day that he hugged me, and it really makes me sick to think that I ever ate or drank anything he gave me. It could have been spiked. I just really can't believe that I was so easily fooled and was able to let someone do that to me. I'm really glad we moved away. Number 3. Female Point of View This happened back in the summer of 2009. I was fresh out of a marriage that I had jumped into too quickly, and here I was looking to find myself again. So I called two of my oldest siblings that live in New York City, and I told them that I was coming for a visit. Needless to say, they were elated. I only had to pay for my bus ticket there. It was rather cheap and I had a good job at the time, so I was able to purchase on a whim. Gleefully, I packed my suitcase so full it could barely zip, with all my favorite summer clothes, jewelry, makeup, etc. I get to the bus station, and all is going well. The lady at the customer service desk hands over my ticket, and I wait for my bus departure to be announced. Along the way on the bus ride, we made a few rest stops until we get to our transfer station in Philly. And this is where things got weird. Everyone transferring buses gets off, and a new group gets on. I see a lot of strange looking people, but none stood out, like this one. There was a guy with long straggly brown hair, thick glasses, and a wild beard. He wasn't bad smelling or homeless looking. In fact, he looked quite well put together, and smelled of cologne. He just kind of had this creepy serial killer lumberjack vibe about him. Whenever I travel, I always take the window seat. It's my thing. And lo and behold, creepy guy sits right next to me. He starts talking. It was innocent enough. I'm not much of a talker by nature, so I just listen. He talks about his sister's wedding, stating that he had just attended it in Philly and was telling me that he was on his way back to New York City. I nodded and smiled. He then said in the creepiest whisper I've ever heard in my life, I'm going to kiss you now. And before I could respond, or react for that matter, he planted his lips onto mine, and his scruffy beard scratched my face. I yelped in horror, and punched him as hard as I could in his arm. He then let out a loud, insane laugh <laughs> and said that he loved me and he knew that I was the one. I've never seen this man a day in my life and I didn't know him from a can of paint. I soon realized that this guy was mentally disturbed. Just as I stood up to cross over him and go complain to the driver, a young woman appeared a few seats behind us, profusely apologizing claiming that he was her cousin and he had a mental disability. She offered to trade seats with me and I accepted. The whole time his laughing gets louder and louder and more disturbing. That was the end of my interaction with them. But the next bus stop as I was getting off to get snacks, I walked past their seats and saw the two of them making out, whispering and laughing. They were very strange people. I don't know if they were really cousins or not, but I was glad to make it to New York City and see my big brother at the station waiting for me. I ran into his arms, clearly shaken. He asked me what was wrong, but I never told him what exactly happened. Nevertheless, he and my sister tried to comfort me, but I still wouldn't spill it. I have been a frequent flyer ever since this incident occurred. Even thinking about it gives me the creeps. Number 2. Female Point of View This happened when I was 9. I left school early because my brother and his friend Sally, who were both 7 at the time, had a dance performance later that day. I was with them and Sally's mom and aunt. 
I did not look like I was with them. My brother is very dark-skinned, and he looked like he could have been Sally's sibling. On the other hand, I'm pasty, almost sickly looking, and we would often get stares when I was with them. So we were sat on the bus. Nine-year-old me is in my school uniform, which is a gray knee-length skirt, white shirt, and my red jumper that is tied around my waist. I was sat alone. I had my lunchbox on the seat next to me, and I was minding my own business. About halfway through our 30-minute journey to the theater where my brother was performing, a guy gets on the bus. He was the very stereotypical creeper type, overweight, smelled unclean, baggy, dirty clothes, and scruffy facial hair. He made his way up the stairs and stood over the seat next to me. At the time, I didn't realize that there was plenty of other empty seats he could have sat in. So I moved my lunch bag, thinking he needed the seat. He sat very close to me, and I could feel his eyes on me. I was uncomfortable, but being the shy kid I was, I didn't say anything. He sat next to me for a good 10 minutes. Then his demeanor changed. He looked around quickly and moved his hand towards my leg. That's when Sally's mom, who was in the seat behind him, hit him over the head with her umbrella and said, Stop looking at her legs, you dirty pig. He moved. Looking at him, I don't think he had ever moved that fast in his life. The rest of the journey was okay. I was shaken, but relieved that Sally's mom had seen what he was about to do. As we got off the bus, I looked up at him, and he gave me a menacing smile and winked. I hurried off the bus and pretended it didn't happen. I saw him on that bus every day for the next year, until he just randomly disappeared. A few years down the line, while searching for a news piece on a local website, I came across a mugshot of the exact man with that same menacing grin. The article explained that he had been caught with child pornography and later admitted to the rape of a five-year-old girl. Number 1 This encounter happened to my mom when she was in middle school in the early 1970s. Her family lived outside of town, so she rode the bus to and from school. She was in 6th grade and had a boyfriend who also rode her bus. They would sit together and hold hands, but they were not inappropriate with their interactions. The bus driver took notice of their relationship and started to make comments to them. He would ask if they kissed a lot, if they tongued, and once even asked him if he sniffed her underwear. Not knowing what to do, they just did their best to ignore him. On the last day of school, the bus route went as usual, except that the driver skipped my mom's stop. When he stopped at the next house several miles away, she tried to get off the bus with the girl that got off at that stop. The kids all knew each other pretty well and were friends. The driver stopped her and made her sit back down. Every stop after that, she would try to get off, and the bus driver would tell her to sit back down, until she was the last one left on the bus. She was already terrified and crying. She said that she didn't remember if she was praying out loud or not, but she remembers just begging for an idea of how to get away. The driver told her to move in front of the bus, right behind his seat. Instead, she picked up her things and moved to the very last seat. On her way, she set her books and things in the middle of the aisle, hoping that if he came after her, he would be slowed down. He finally started back down her road towards her house, but turned off onto a dirt road leading back to some brush. She finally decided that even if he slowed down enough, she was going out the back emergency door and running for it. As he turned down another dirt road, leading deeper into the brush, she happened to glance out the back window to see her dad and her older brother and their truck following behind. She shouted up to the driver, You better stop this bus right now. That's my dad behind the bus. He then stopped the bus and opened the doors for her to get off. But she was too scared to move. Within a few seconds, 
Her dad was on the bus, standing right up next to the driver so that she could walk around him. He told her to go get in the truck with her brother. As she sat in the truck, she could see her dad through the back window, just going off on the guy. Only verbally, unfortunately. When her dad got back into the truck, he hugged her like never before, and she just lost it crying. She knew that if her dad was scared, she had just escaped with her life. Now, this wasn't just a coincidence that her dad had found her. Every kid who got off the bus after they missed my mom's stop had gone home and told their parents that the driver wouldn't let her off the bus and that she was really scared and crying. The parents all called my grandparents to let them know about the stories that they were getting. My grandparents never reported the incident to the police or the school, but they did talk to the owner of the bus company and they never saw that guy driving again. My mom believes that they didn't report it to the police because her dad had threatened the driver's life and would, in turn, report that to the police. My grandfather went to his grave without ever revealing what he said to that bus driver. Several years later, my mom was talking to her mother-in-law about grandma's cousin who was married to a guy from my mom's hometown. She was telling her that this guy was in prison for impregnating his 14-year-old stepdaughter. As an off-the-cuff remark, she mentioned that the guy used to be a school bus driver in the district where my mom went to school. My mom almost passed out at this news. I know what you're probably thinking, and I feel the same way, that they should have said something to the police and had him arrested long before he found another potential victim. I believe they made a mistake in that regard, but I'm glad he ended up in prison though. Number 3 Okay, so this happened to me about 7 years ago, when I first started high school. The school was about a 10 minute walk away from my little brother's school, so every day I would walk up there to meet him. It was a pretty safe walk along a main road with lots of sunlight and cars, but not many people most of the time. Occasionally, you would get other school children or some runners and some old people walking to their apartments and of course the people waiting at the bus stop. The bus stop was halfway between my school and my brother's and there were only ever about two people waiting there. One afternoon, I was walking up to meet my brother. That day, I left my headphones at home so I couldn't listen to music while walking, which is what I would normally do. So I was just walking and enjoying the sun. When I reached the bus stop, I noticed an old man sitting on the bench waiting for a bus. I passed him and didn't think much of it because he seemed harmless. I would say this guy was about 60 to 65 years old, pretty short and not very fit. As soon as I walked past him, I heard him get up. I didn't see a bus coming. Maybe he was checking the timetable, but of course not. I turned my head to check, and this guy is like five steps behind me with his eyes stuck on me. I started to speed walk, but then I heard him speed up too. I looked behind me and sure enough, he's speed walking as well. I was scared. He hadn't taken his eyes off me, and now, whenever I looked back, he was giving me this creepy devilish grin. There was nobody else around, and I was about 200 meters from my brother's school. I decided to book it. I looked behind me, and the old guy was now running after me. I couldn't believe it. He was faster than I expected, too. Every time I looked back, he was staring and smiling. I was almost in tears. I was so scared that I wasn't going to make it. Now, I know you might think that a young teenage girl could outrun a man in his 60s, but with a heavy school bag and a messed up knee from gymnastics, I was about as equipped to run as he was. By this point, I could see my brother's school and some kids leaving. I was kind of relieved and I thought the old man would ease up and notice that other people were around. But no. What does this guy do? He starts yelling to the people, saying, My granddaughter, she's running away from me. Get her. She's in trouble all the while giving me this evil grin. 
I then stop because I've come to a massive road and I don't want to get hit by a car. This guy gets close enough to grab my bag and that he was going to win and take me away. I screamed and ran for my life, not caring about the cars. I got to my brother's school and looked back to see the guy jogging towards me. I ran into the main building and told the receptionist what happened. She looked outside and saw a man waiting outside the school gate, moving his head around as if he was trying to spot someone. I told her that that was him. She then told me to wait with her while she called the police. The man walked away after about 10 minutes, but the police did catch him and we found out that he had been offering candy to kids from my brother's school and trying to get them to come home with them in the afternoons. I walked on the other side of the road from then on, avoiding the bus stop and anyone I would pass. Number 2 I grew up in rural Michigan and rode the bus to school every morning. We lived in a house at the bottom of a hill on a country road. My bus stop, however, was at the top of the hill after you passed my house. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was 7 or 8 years old. I woke up one morning and got ready for school like I usually did. My bus picked me up around 7 a.m., right when the sun was starting to come up. But there were still spots of darkness deep in the woods. I was the only kid who was picked up at my bus stop. So I would stand at the edge of the woods and wait until the bus came. My mom or dad would have to drop me off about five minutes before the bus came and hightail it to work in order to make it there by 8 o'clock. It's not that they felt completely comfortable doing this, but they didn't have many options. We lived in a safe area, or so we thought, and the bus arrived on time 99% of the time so they weren't too worried that anything would happen to me in the five minutes I was left alone. So I'm standing there cold as shit, waiting for the bus to come, watching the sun rise slowly in the sky. It's still a little dark out, but not yet bright enough for me to see what's going on around me. I saw the lights of the bus in the distance, on time as usual, and it came to a stop right in front of me. My bus driver, Mrs. Teresa, opened the door and said good morning and gestured for me to hop on. I walked to my seat, put my stuff down, and noticed that the bus wasn't moving yet. Mrs. Teresa still had the door ajar. She just sat there, leaning slightly out of her seat, staring into the woods for a good minute or so. We were off and on our way to school after picking up a few more kids. After arriving at school, Mrs. Teresa escorted us in, which is something that she never did. And I remember seeing her slip into the office and talking to one of the secretaries. I went through my regular school day and I was picked up by my dad in the car rider line as normal. When he picked me up though, he started asking me all kinds of questions. Did the bus pick you up okay this morning? Did any car stop and blow their horn at you as you waited? Strange questions that he had never asked before. The next morning, my parents didn't take me to the bus stop. My mom dropped me off at school before going to work at a later time. This continued, alternating a drop-off by my mom or dad for the remainder of the school year. At the same time, I noticed they changed my bus stop. Years later, I found out why my bus driver went into the school that day and why my bus stop was relocated. When Mrs. Teresa picked me up that morning, she saw a man standing in the woods behind where I was. She alerted the school secretary, who alerted the transportation office for the school district, and then the police. The police investigated and found some items wrapped up in a t-shirt back in the woods. A hunting knife, rope, a rag or washcloth, and tape. The police never found out who that shit belonged to but the bus driver, my parents, and the police felt certain that whoever it belonged to had the worst intentions. I think about this often and wonder what would have happened to me had my bus driver been a few minutes late or had she not noticed the man standing in the woods after I boarded the bus. Because of this incident, the school district changed my bus stop to be located right in front of my house. That way I could stay in my house until the bus pulled up. No more standing by the woods for me. 
I resumed riding the bus the next school year. A few years ago, I was leaving my grad school office late around 10 p.m. to catch the bus home. I walked from the university campus through relatively busy well-lit streets to the main road in my area of the city, 109th Street in Edmonton. I was waiting for the bus at a shelter as it was in the middle of the winter, snowing, and a bit cold. The buses ran about every 15 minutes, so I wasn't worried or nervous, just patiently waiting to get home. I was listening to my music on my headphones when I noticed a guy walk up to the shelter. I looked at him briefly and did that little Canadian half smile of acknowledgement and went back to listening to my music and reading Reddit. A few minutes passed and I could hear him start talking to me. Well, I assumed that it was me, as there was no one else around. I looked up and he was staring right at me, smiling a bit oddly and speaking to me. I took out my headphones and said, Excuse me? He kept smiling and blathering on, asking me about my day, the weather, what I like to do, etc. I don't know what it is about me, but I'm a perennial people pleaser. I don't like confrontation, and my main aim in life seems to be keep the peace. So I answered a few of his questions as politely and as nonspecifically as I could with one earbud still in my ear. He just kept blathering on and on, and I just sort of nodded my head politely. He went on for about 10 minutes, and I just had this sinking feeling in my stomach about this guy, like something was just a little off, but enough to make me nervous. After about 10 minutes, I could see the bus rolling up, which was a huge relief for me. No one else had arrived at the bus stop, and I could see at least 10 to 15 people on the bus which was great. I got on the bus and sat near the front, and the guy sat across from me so he could keep talking to me. I originally intended to head down to my house, to the west of the street that I was on, but after this guy decided to be my personal parrot, I decided, screw it, I'm going to my boyfriend's instead, directly to the east of the street I was on. I was still getting a very uncomfortable feeling from this guy, so I decided to push the bus stop button a stop early and see what the guy did. The bus came to a stop at my request and the guy got up. I didn't move. Isn't this your stop too? He asked me. I said, whoops, I must have hit the wrong stop. He looked at me and said, oh that's funny, I mixed it up too. This isn't my stop either. And then he sat back down. At this point, I'm pretty freaked out. I hit the bus stop for the next stop and texted my boyfriend to come out and meet me at 109th Street. I got up to leave the bus once it stopped and the creepy dude followed. I crossed the road and he was still tailing me, still talking away at me and still asking me questions. Once I got to the other side of the road, I told him that I had to go and that my boyfriend was meeting me. He looked irritated at the idea of my boyfriend and tried to walk with me a bit more, but I stopped and I told him that I was walking on alone. Can I have your number? He asked. I panic and just froze. I decided to give him almost my number, just the last four digits scrambled. I read it off to him and said goodnight and started walking away quickly. I made it maybe 20 steps away and I could hear someone jogging after me. Hey, he yelled. I think there was a mix up. I tried calling the number and it wasn't you. He jogged up level next to me and was still smiling that same fucking smile, staring at me. Uh, how weird, I said, grabbing my phone. I pretended to check it for a missed call and quickly texted my boyfriend that I was terrified and that he needed to get here now. So what's your real number then? He asked. I honestly don't know what I would have done. I think I probably would have given him my real number. I just had no idea what to do. It was cold, it was winter, and it was dark in this little residential neighborhood that I had entered. And I knew that I couldn't outrun him. Luckily for me, that was when my boyfriend came running up. He's six foot three and somewhat imposing. And I turned to the guy and said, have a good night and jogged up to my boyfriend and just launched myself at him. 
I didn't look back at the creepy dude, but I did tell my boyfriend to please make sure all the doors were locked and the windows were closed before going to bed that night. Back when I first moved up to New York, the fumes from the traffic outside made my asthma come back with a vengeance. I ended up going to a doctor and he said that I didn't have to worry anymore because he had this top of the line asthma medication that would completely rid me of my symptoms. I was over the moon when he told me that as I was having a really rough time like couldn't sleep and stuff because of it. So I got the prescription, hit up a local pharmacy for the pills, then got home and took like three of them immediately so I could finally get some decent sleep. I take the pills, take a shower, grab a bite to eat, and then I head to bed and read a book until my lungs untighten and I start to feel sleepy. I remember turning my lamp off before I settled down to go to sleep and the last thing I did was cuddle my cat and be like, finally, we can get some sleep, don't it? From memory, this would have been maybe 10.30 at night, so it was still relatively early, especially by Brooklyn standards. Then at maybe 1.30 in the morning, I woke up, still with nice clear lungs, but when I opened my eyes, I saw a short, dark shape standing in the middle of my bedroom. I immediately shot up out of bed, switched on the lamp on my bedside table, and got ready to either kick whoever's butt or run screaming from the room. But when the light lit up the room, there was absolutely nothing there. It looked like it could have been a kid. It was that short, but then it was also way too bulky to be a kid. It looked like a smaller version of a large, muscular grown man. Needless to say, I was seriously unsettled by what I saw, or what I thought I saw, and the whole thing basically ruined any chance I had at a decent night's sleep as I was absolutely terrified to see that thing again. I only really fell back asleep as I saw the dawn start to break outside and then about an hour later I had to be up for work. The next day, I was terrified, talking to my friends in a group chat but they just thought that it was hilarious, telling me that there's no such things as ghosts and whatnot and that I must have just imagined the whole thing. When I saw on my grandma's grave that not a word of what I was saying was a lie, they just carried on making fun of me, telling me to get an exorcist and all this nonsense, and that if I was going to make up a ghost story, at least make it spooky. But I wasn't making anything up. I didn't believe in the supernatural or anything like that, but what I experienced had me seriously questioning whether I'd been right to just assume it was all nonsense. Because what else explained what I saw and how quickly it disappeared? When they finally started to believe me, one suggested I'd been experiencing some kind of sleep paralysis. They had a cousin that had gone through a literal nightmare of a time dealing with a condition that made it feel like there was some kind of demon in the room with them at night, and they couldn't do a single thing to stop it because they couldn't move. Only, that didn't make sense because the moment I saw the shape of the thing, I jumped up and turned my light on to see if anything was there, which is right when the thing just seemed to completely disappear. That's when my buddy starts getting seriously concerned for me. I think he finally started to appreciate that I wasn't just making stuff up. After that, he actually starts trying to help me figure it all out, and we go through a ton of different medical conditions and stuff before he finally asked me if I'm on drugs. He meant like actual illegal drugs or whatever, but that's when it hit me. I was on a new medication for my asthma, and the medication was singular. I grabbed the box, took out the little piece of paper on the inside, then started reading through the side effects. That's how I found out that in some cases, your first few doses can cause waking dreams around your sleeping hours, like brief hallucinations that are basically just dreams bleeding over into reality. It was such a relief knowing wasn't going crazy, and even more of a relief knowing that nothing remotely supernatural was going on, because I can't even describe how terrifying of a concept that was to me. I'd grown up not believing in anything like that, and that sudden but false realization that spirits, demons, whatever you want to call them, were real. That's a feeling of terror that I don't think I'll ever forget. So just a little warning out there. Be careful with Singular, because as much as it did a great job in ridding me of my asthma symptoms, I went right back to using my inhaler. No, it wasn't nearly as effective and I still had a lot of trouble sleeping for a while until I finally moved to a less air-polluted city, but 
It was way, way better than suffering from hallucinations, especially scary ones in the middle of the night. I'm a senior in college at the moment. This happened during last semester in the fall. Like most college kids, I use Snapchat to communicate with the majority of my friends, and I've used it for many years. I don't really get added by people that much unless I know them in person. So around the beginning of last semester when I started getting added by people a lot, I thought it was strange. It didn't take me long at all to figure out that the people adding me were bots. I would get added by a bot roughly once a week, sometimes multiple times in a week. They would always be a female, and oftentimes would send me some sort of spam chat message or something like that. When this happened, I would always just ignore it and would never add them back or anything like that. One day, I got added by another account with a female name. I looked at the account to see that it was more than likely another spam account. I didn't recognize the name, and the user didn't have a snap score when I looked. After that, I deleted them and moved on. But a short time later, I received a Snapchat from them. It was a text message, and I expected it to be another spam message. But when I clicked on the chat, it was pretty threatening. They said something like, I better watch my back, and I was in trouble. They also said they were going to get me. This actually got me to respond. I asked who this was and why they said that. They only responded to say basically the same thing, but in all caps. I was kind of creeped out by this. I was a pretty quiet guy and didn't really have that many friends at college, but the friends that I did have were very close and I knew they wouldn't do something like that to me. But still, I decided to ask any of them if they knew anything about it. They all told me no and didn't seem to know why I was getting these messages. The next day, I got another threatening and cryptic message. It was just saying basically that I was a bad person and that I was in trouble. I asked who the person was who was sending me this. They didn't respond to me at all. And at that point, I decided to block them. That way, they wouldn't be able to contact me anymore. But later in that day, I saw I was added by another account. This account was another female name. I decided to look up the name, but it came back with no results on all social media sites that I looked it up on. They sent me the same message again, and I immediately blocked the account this time also. After that, I started getting paranoid. Everywhere that I went around campus, I would wonder if I was being watched or who wanted to get me. When I was in classes, I would wonder if it was another student. Or when I was in the cafeteria, I would look around to see if anyone was watching me. I never seemed to get any clues as to why someone was threatening me like this. I didn't get at it again for two days, but then I was added by another person. This person's name I also didn't recognize, and I got another message from them. At this point, I looked in my settings and was able to change them so that nobody could send me snaps unless I had added them back. This made me feel a little bit better. I did get added by another person the next day, but I never bothered to look after I didn't recognize their name. After this, I figured whoever it was would give up. I didn't get added by anyone else for a while. I was starting to feel better about things, until one day, I was added by another user again. When I looked, it was actually a girl who I had in a class with me, and she occasionally talked to me. I added her back, but a short time later, I saw that she had snapped me. When I opened up the message, I could clearly see that it was someone else pretending to be her. Her snap score was very low, and I got another threatening message. I immediately blocked the account. This really creeped me out to know that whoever was threatening me even knew the name of the classmates who I talked to. For the rest of the semester, I was on edge, but I didn't get added by any more people. This semester has gone by fine, and nothing has happened since. I just still wonder who it was, though, and why they were doing it. I'm a 23-year-old female living in a two-bedroom house with my roommate. I moved into the house last year. My roommate is one of my good friends from college who happened to take a job in the same city as me, which isn't very far from the college we attended together. I would use Snapchat every day and had a pretty large number of friends on there and people who I snapped. I would get added by guys that I didn't know quite a bit. Sometimes I wouldn't know them at all, 
and other times they would be guys that I went to school with or actually did know in some way. One night last summer, I was in my bedroom just chilling on my laptop when I casually looked at my phone to see a few Snapchat notifications. I saw that somebody had added me named Josh M. I didn't really think that I recognized him, but I wasn't quite sure, so I added him back and then was going to send him a snap asking who he was. But before I could, he beat me to it. He sent me a snap, and I opened it up. It was a picture of about half of his face, and he said, Hey. He appeared to be in a dark area, and I couldn't tell much detail at all about him other than he was white with darkish hair. I sent him a snap back saying, Do I know you? He snapped me back almost immediately saying, Yes, don't you remember me? I asked him where I knew him from because I really didn't remember him. He just responded with a snap of his face and no words. I wasn't believing that he knew me at all because after seeing more snaps of his face, he wasn't looking any more familiar. I didn't respond to him, but he sent me another snap a minute later asking me what I was doing. I told him nothing and asked him once again how he knew me. He didn't answer me this time either and once again sent a blank snap of his face. He wasn't really making any sense and when I left him on red again, he sent me another snap asking where I was. In that moment, I was happy to remember that I never had my location turned on in Snapchat, so nobody could ever tell where I was. I wanted to know more about this guy, so I clicked on his profile on Snapchat to see his username. But when I did, I noticed that he had his Snapchat location turned on. I then clicked on the map to see where he was and maybe get a better idea of where he was from. But when I did, I couldn't believe my eyes. He appeared to be right outside my house on the street. My heart suddenly started racing. My blinds were covering the windows of my bedroom so I couldn't see out. I decided to slowly walk over to them and carefully look out. I noticed a car parked on the side of the street. It was a little ways away and I figured this had to be the guy. I then went back on my phone to see that he had snapped me again. I opened it. I could now see that he was in a car. He asked me to stop leaving him on red and at this point I sent him a snap asking him where he was right now. I saw he opened the snap right away, but he didn't respond right away like he usually did. I waited several minutes, but he never did reply. I then looked back at the snap map, but he was now gone. He had turned his location off. I was afraid he had realized I was onto him and was now hiding. I slowly went back to the window, but when I looked out, the car was now gone. I was terrified. I now had no idea where he was and thought maybe he just parked down the street and was going to try to break into my house or something. I called my roommate to tell her what was going on, but I knew that she was at work and the chances of her picking up were slim. Sure enough, she didn't answer. I quickly went around the house making sure that all of the doors and windows were closed and locked. Thankfully, they all were. I went back into my bedroom and locked the door. I was just hoping that whoever this Josh guy was had actually left and wouldn't come back. About 20 minutes later, I heard a noise coming from my front door area. My heart started to pound even harder than it already was. I knew the door was locked though, so I was just hoping whoever was in there wouldn't try to break in. I got out my phone ready to call the police. Then, I heard the sound of the door opening. I couldn't believe it and I started to freak out. Until finally, I heard the voice of my roommate. It was her coming home from work early and not the Josh guy. I was so relieved and went over and told her everything. We were both a little creeped out for the rest of the night, but the Josh guy never came back. The next day, the Josh user had been deleted from Snapchat. I never did find out who he was or why he was seemingly stalking me. A few months ago, my best friend Joe and I got invited to one of our other friend's birthday parties. Unfortunately for me, I had to work that night, and I wasn't able to go. However, afterwards, Joe asked if I'd pick him up, and then he'd buy me food. I said sure, because I was always down for free food. I guess they had the party at a bar downtown in the major city that we lived near. I was kind of bummed that I had to work, because as I was at work, I saw a few Snapchat stories of some of my friends, and it looked like a pretty good time. When I finally got off of work at about 10.30pm, I got a Snapchat from Joe saying he was ready for me to come pick him up. We mainly communicated through the text chat on Snapchat. I told him that I was on the way and asked him where to pick him up from. 
He then sent me his location on the snap map, and I could tell the general area where it was. I asked him for a specific address, but he just said to follow his Snapchat location. This made it a little bit harder with no address, but I could still do it. I drove to the area, which was about 15 minutes from where I was. I got to where Joe was on the snap map, but it was in what appeared to be a back alley behind several businesses. It didn't really look like bars though, just more like warehouse or apartments or something like that. I told Joe I was there, and he said he would be out in a minute. Then he sent me a snap saying he couldn't find me and asked me to get out of my car. I was wondering what Joe's problem was because I thought he was acting really strange. I parked my car and got out. I wasn't intending on being out of my car for long, just enough to call out for Joe to see if I could see where he was. But what happened instead was I saw three men start to run out from the building that I was next to. They were running straight for me. I quickly got back inside of my car and locked the door before the men reached me. Thankfully, I hadn't gone more than two steps from my car, or I wouldn't have made it back. I had no idea who these men were, but they were now trying to open my doors and all shouting at me. I sped away as fast as I could and drove all the way home. I contacted a few of my other friends who had been with Joe that night, and it was told to me that Joe had lost his phone at the bar earlier. I realized someone must have took it, and was now pretending to be Joe and communicating with his contacts. I went to the police and told them everything. Joe's phone was found cracked and in a dumpster a week later. Joe was able to get a new phone, but I don't think they ever found out who the men were who took it and chased after me. This happened pretty recent, about three weeks ago. Myself and three friends were hanging out at a shopping center one evening. We were messing around posting clips on TikTok. Then one of my friends started laughing, and I asked her what she was laughing at. She told me that guy behind us kept staring at me. When I turned around, it was some older guy just watching me. He had black sunglasses, a cap, an old Adidas tracksuit with scuffed up shoes, and had a disgusting looking beard. My friends thought it was hilarious, but I found it really weird. Then another one of my friends said, she thinks that guy lives on her street, about a few houses down from her. She said that he actually follows her on TikTok. At that point, I quickly got my phone out to check if he was following me, and he was. I had to block him because he seemed a bit creepy. We went to get McDonald's before we went home, and I received a message on TikTok from someone. It was that guy who had been following us. His name was Greg, and he wrote, Why did you block me? With two emojis. One was a crying face, and the other one was an angry face. He had actually created another account that day in the shopping center. I blocked that account as well, hoping that would be the end of it. I didn't mention it to my friends this time, knowing they would just laugh. That night, I was up late and had Netflix on in the background as I was chatting with my friends on Facebook while scrolling through TikTok. I got up to use the bathroom, and when I returned, I had three messages from my friends, all saying the same thing. All were things like, who's in your room? And what's up with your last post? I asked them what they were talking about and they told me to check my TikTok, so I did. It was a clip of my bedroom. It was a clip of someone picking up my phone and recording the inside of my room. At that point, I heard a creaking. Then I heard a man's voice say, Sorry, please don't scream. And turned to see my closet door slightly open. I started to scream when the same guy who had been following us burst out of my closet and tried to cover my mouth. Thank God I screamed and it was enough for my parents to hear. They came upstairs and my dad tackled the guy to the floor. The police were called and he was arrested. We were informed that the guy had straight up admitted to stalking and breaking and entering. One of my friends pointed out, if I go back and look at the post on TikTok, from when we were in the shopping center, you can see Greg is in almost all of those pictures, somewhere in the background. I haven't heard what's going to happen to Greg yet, but 
I just hope he won't ever come near us again. I'm 16, and this story happened about four months ago. My friend Lisa and I frequently use TikTok. We both have about 100 followers each. Not a lot, mainly just friends and family. One day I was in a grocery store nearby where we live, and there was a stand that was selling unusual items such as Ouija boards, uh, spell books, and other creepy novelty items. I thought to pick up a Ouija board so that Lisa and I could mess around with it maybe post some ghost encounters on TikTok. I told Lisa about it, and she thought it was a good idea. So the following Friday night, when Lisa's parents would be gone for most of the evening, we thought it would be the perfect time to test out the board. We turned all the lights out, lit some candles, and pulled the curtains closed. We asked the cliche questions like, is there a presence, can you hear us, what's your name, etc. We posted a few clips on TikTok saying nothing yet. Then, one of our followers commented to ask if there was something stronger than a spirit. So we gave it a shot. We asked the board if there was something other than a human spirit in the room. Me and Lisa waited anxiously, hoping we would get a response, but sort of hoping we wouldn't. About 20 seconds went by before the candles suddenly went out and the room went dead cold. Even though the room was already dark, it felt like it had gotten darker somehow. You could honestly feel something was with us. We put the board away and decided to watch a movie. We posted another clip on TikTok explaining what happened. Most people in the comments said that it was probably the wind or something. One person said it did work, uh, but we just ignored him, thinking that he was trying to creep us out or something. About two days later, Lisa started acting weird. She wasn't eating much and stopped posting on TikTok, which was weird as she was on it all the time. This went on for about a week and a half. She stopped posting, she barely spoke a word to me, and she didn't really go to school. The strangest thing happened after a few weeks passed. After her not responding to any of my texts or calls, I went to her house and her mom told me that she had gone to stay with her grandparents for a while. I asked what was wrong, and she just said she hadn't been feeling well and just needed a break. The last post Lisa made was her trying to crack a smile in her bedroom. Then there was a noise coming from behind her. To describe it, kind of sounded like a low, guttural growling. She was slowly turning around as if something was behind her. The clip ended there, and like I said, this was around four months ago, and I haven't heard or seen Lisa since then. I never really believed in anything paranormal, but I honestly think when we used the Ouija board, we let something dark into our lives, and whatever it was stayed with Lisa. I just hope she's okay. Recently, I, I quit posting on TikTok. I used to frequently use TikTok watching trick shots, gaming posts, and other comedy clips. There is one guy who I followed though. I won't say his name, but the clips he posted were very unusual. They weren't very nice, to be honest. He used to wear this featureless mask and do things like spy on people in their house and frighten them. He even went as far as to attack someone. I gotta say, I'm not sure if it was real or not, because the clips would end before you could tell. But it felt genuine to me. I'm not proud that I watched this guy harass and assault people, but I did. One day I noticed I had gotten a new follower on TikTok. It was the same guy that I just mentioned. At first I was a bit worried but shrugged it off. I was in the underground parking lot after I was done grocery shopping. It was late in the evening so the parking lot was practically empty. Well, it looked empty. But I could feel that there was someone there with me. I suddenly became very paranoid. That night, I was scrolling through my TikTok and saw a clip that made my heart sink. It was me in the parking lot looking anxiously around my surroundings. It was by the same guy that had followed me on TikTok from earlier. The next two days were the same. I was very paranoid thinking I was being watched and followed. 
and my suspicions were confirmed because each night that guy had posted, it was clips of me. I felt sick and decided to call the police. Unfortunately, they said there wasn't much they could do as no crime had been committed. A week went by and the post stopped. I started to relax thinking maybe he had just moved on and it was all part of his prank thing or whatever. That was until I was attacked outside my house. I was hit over the head with something. I fell to the ground nearly knocked out, but I was still conscious enough for a moment to see. What I saw will haunt me forever. It was a man standing over me with a featureless mask holding a phone up. I passed out, but the next thing I remember was waking up in a hospital. I was found by someone who lived nearby. I told the police of what happened, but his account had been deleted. Whether or not his clips were staged or fake, his assault on me certainly was real. The weird thing I don't understand is why he deleted his account after attacking me. Unlike the other people, I deleted my TikTok. And this incident and the experience has scarred me for life. I just want to tell you, be aware of your surroundings because you never know who could be watching you. And honestly, I would stay off of TikTok and any other social media. Back in 2014, I joined a Facebook group that was started specifically for people who are from the town I grew up in, in Southern California. The whole group shared memories of the town, and everyone seemed nice, except for one person. There's always at least one asshole. This guy got on the bad side of one of the admins, whose name was Robert, and ended up being booted from the group. I'll note that I was in my mid-30s at the time, and most of the members were at least 20 years older than me. Robert was approaching 60 and was married with children who were about my age. Robert took a liking to me. Since he was married, I didn't think his friendship would go any further than that, but I was mistaken. He said that I was a down-to-earth girl and was easy to talk to. He and I exchanged phone numbers and he would message me quite a bit. However, Robert took it a step further and found out where I lived my landline number, and my mother's address in California. He had a subscription to one of those sites that contain information on people, their age, phone numbers, possible relatives, previous addresses, etc. He found out through Facebook when my birthday was, and he sent me flowers. I thanked him, but I started to get suspicious. His behavior was becoming alarming. He started complaining that all his wife wanted from him was his pain pills and money. Around this time, I met the man who would eventually become my husband, and of course, I announced it on Facebook. Robert went into a ballistic rage upon hearing this, saying that I should have known that he was in love with me. I told him, You're married. Why are you in love with another woman? He began texting me at least 10 to 20 times a day. One day, out of curiosity... I did listen to some of the voicemails I got. In one of the messages, he claimed that I owed him $13,000. He then started making threats about how he would come to where I lived and would also pay my mother a visit. I blocked him on my landline and informed my mother about the situation. Robert got clever and started texting me from random numbers located all over California. He even sent letters to my home and nothing he said in those letters made any sense. That's when I decided that I needed a restraining order. I tried twice through my county court, but since I lived in Washington State at the time, the judge wouldn't grant it since we lived in different states. Once Robert found out that I couldn't file a restraining order, he sent me more hateful messages and told me that I would never get rid of him. So I went back to court with the new messages. For this new hearing, Robert mailed in a letter of rebuttal. He claimed that he was a civil servant who had worked at a school district at one time and was an electrician by trade. He also said that he was on disability and couldn't drive longer for more than a half an hour without experiencing excruciating pain and posed the question, how could he possibly come to Washington State? 
I told the judge that this wasn't true because he openly posted all day about his motorcycle trips to Malibu on Facebook. Regardless of the evidence, I wasn't granted a restraining order and I felt failed by the system. I blocked him on all social media, emails, and phone numbers, but he obviously would still call using new numbers. He made a duplicate Facebook page with my profile picture and sent out friend requests to all of my friends. He had my real Facebook profile blocked and I found out when a friend messaged me. I got a friend request from you, but I already thought we were friends. And I eventually moved into a new place. Things died down for a while, but Robert somehow found me on LinkedIn. After that, I straight up deleted LinkedIn and Facebook, and I saw that he even followed me on my YouTube page. I don't know how to remove someone, so I just blocked him there. The last time I heard from Robert, was an email that I received from an account with the name John Sims. I knew it was him because he references trying to find my brother years back and how I asked him for his help. I didn't ask anyone for help by the way because I don't have a relationship with my brother because he has a drug addiction problem and is a diagnosed schizophrenic. To wrap up this insane story, I'll include a screenshot of the email he sent and a recording of some of the messages he left. This happened last year when I was 14. There's this dating app for teenagers. I used it as more of a joke. It was connected to Snapchat, so whenever you matched with someone, you would add them to Snapchat so you could continue talking to your match. As I said, at first I was using it as a joke, but then I matched with this really good looking guy, and I thought, well, would it hurt to try? So I accepted his request to be my friend on Snapchat. I sent a shy hi to him and waited for a response. It took him about two hours to respond and the only thing he sent was a blank black picture. I didn't think too much of it and I continued on with my day. But the next day I get a message from him, a picture of a very familiar thing, my school. It was only a little jarring, but I figured he probably went to the same school and we had just never met. Then my phone began to vibrate like crazy during a class. To give a little perspective, we have glass doors and windows. They look out into the corridors during class. And when I checked my phone, I saw maybe 15 pictures sent to me from the same guy. They were pictures of me sitting at my desk in the classroom. The pictures kept coming. They seemed to have been taken from outside that window next to the door. When I looked over, I saw someone standing there just outside that window. He had a phone in his hand and he was pointing at me. Whoever it was was wearing a black hoodie. The hood covered half of his face and the other half was pale and he had a sharp jawline. I could see thin lips curved into a grin and I saw my friend. She was looking at him too and her face turned red and she began to shake. We were the only ones who saw them because as fast as we tried to say something, the figure was gone. My friend stood up from her chair and went to the door to open it. It caught my teacher's attention and we had to explain what we were doing. We had to tell them what we saw. My teacher went out herself to look for whoever this was and then she even told the office. They let out a message over the speakers telling everyone to look out for this man. Ever since then, I haven't used Snapchat it was one of the apps I used all the time before. It still creeps me out, though it may have been a joke and it must have been someone who knew me from before, but it was still horrifying. It had made me a lot more paranoid about strangers on the internet. My name is Anna. 
I am a girl in high school who lives with my parents and little sister, Emma. Ever since I was little, I've always looked up to Emma. She's always been the most pretty and sociable girl no matter what room she enters. She seems to just have this light around her that can brighten up anyone's day. Everybody in my family just loves her. When I would have problems in math class, she would ace every exam. My parents have often said to her that she will conquer the world someday with all of her success. All of this aside, I still couldn't get over the fact that she was able to get a boyfriend before me. Even when I was dating a guy and brought him over to my house, they would instantly lose interest in me after seeing my sister. All they would have to do is start talking to my sister for a little bit before they asked me for her number. I can't even begin to tell you how hard it was to keep a boyfriend with Emma as my sister. Yeah, my own sister stealing my boyfriends. It wasn't easy to deal with. Emma was two grades below me, but we still went to the same school. That meant I always had to introduce her to my friends, and Emma never failed from grabbing all of the attention for herself. My friends would almost ignore me to talk to my sister. I've always been under her shadow, whether I liked it or not. But I have to admit, I was addicted to her smile and personality too. My sister, in her sophomore year of high school, decided to start an Instagram page. She always wanted to be a model and liked to be in the spotlight, so she decided that this is the best way to start. She instantly gained hundreds of followers within just weeks. It then turned into thousands of new followers monthly. The success wasn't limited to just followers. She ended up receiving a ton of business proposals to where she would promote their different beauty products. It all happened so quickly, I was astonished by her achievement and wanted to start an Instagram page for myself. But unfortunately, my photos weren't as good as hers, so my page didn't even reach 100 followers in total. Despite my bittersweet relationship with my sister, I've always liked when we would gossip to each other about boys. At the time, she was single and wasn't looking for a boyfriend. She wanted to just focus on education and developing her Instagram business. This mindset of hers, however, all changed out of the blue when she told me she received a message from some guy on Instagram. Hey Anna, you'll never believe what just happened to me. This really handsome football player DM'd me on Instagram. At first I thought he would just be like all the other guys and send me a dick pic, but I thought to give him the benefit of the doubt anyways, I ended up spending over two hours just texting him. He's so sweet and we have such similar personalities and interests, it's felt like I've known him for years. I really want to meet him. You know, that sounds great and all, but you really never know with people on the internet. For all you know, he could just be pretending. He could even be a stalker. Just be careful with that kind of stuff, okay? Oh, come on, Anna. You're just being paranoid. I think you've been watching too many scary movies lately. Just please be careful, Emma. She now was spending all of her free time texting this new guy. It was like she was becoming addicted to her phone, but she seemed to be happier than ever. Me, on the other hand, knew that internet relationships can be dangerous because you never really know who's actually behind the other side of the screen. I also knew that my sister would ignore any red flags that might even come up with the guy because of how naive and gullible she is. This texting back and forth between them lasted for around two months. She told me the reason why they haven't even met in person yet because he just wanted to get to know her more. This was an excuse she was completely content with. It wasn't until a few days later till she came to me with what I believed was inevitable. I'd never seen her in such a broken state before. She could hardly speak with all the tears in her eyes. I immediately thought the guy on Instagram was to blame, but I asked her what happened anyways. She said something along the lines of, It's that guy I told you about. He's actually so evil. Please help me, Anna. I don't know what to do. I fell for his trap. Wait, just, just slow down a minute. What exactly happened? I sent him my nudes, Anna. I'm so sorry. I knew I shouldn't have done it, but he just seems so nice. Wait, what trap did you fall into? He wants a lot of money, Anna. He threatened to post these pictures online if I don't send him what he wants. I advised her to just send him the money and that maybe the situation will just blow over. She told her parents about what was going on she would definitely get in trouble. 
Emma followed my advice, and for a while there was silence. But this silence couldn't always last forever. The guy messaged Emma, demanding the same amount of money. Only this time, he said he will now demand the money monthly, otherwise her nude photos would be posted everywhere. My sister had no other option than to comply, because she had become so popular in our city that a scandal such as this would forever ruin her image as well as her developing career. Thankfully, she had enough money from all her business promotions that she would be able to afford this little secret of hers. Again, I advised her to do what he wants, not to inform anyone besides me, because then her secret could spread like wildfire. Over the next few months, her mental health had a visible decline. She was so consumed by stress that the guy would post those pictures of her, she wasn't able to sleep. She was hardly recognizable anymore. Her once happy-go-lucky self had turned into nothing but self-isolation and sadness. Small cuts appeared all over her wrists from what I can only assume to be out of self-harm. It got to be so bad, Emma had to see a psychiatrist be prescribed antidepressants. Her grades were the next to suffer, and then finally, her Instagram too. I heard her crying every night into her polo, and she was rapidly losing weight and stopped smiling in her Instagram pictures, which caused her followers not to like them anymore. She ended up telling my parents about the whole thing behind my back. That's when everything changed. She first told them about the blackmailing and then showed them the cuts on her wrists. While my mother cried, my father decided to act fast and drove Emma to the police station to make a report about it. The first thing the police did was track the location of the device that had been in contact with Emma all these months. It took a few days, but the police called us back with information that I think took everybody for surprise. The device that had sent those messages to Emma came within our own house. The police officers then requested to speak with her father alone. I found out later that the officers suggested that Emma was the one that had been sending those messages to herself and that this self-destructive behavior was a sign of serious mental illness. My mother later tried to talk to Emma about the possibility of it being true, to which Emma denied everything. One night, I overheard my parents talking about sending Emma to a psychiatric hospital. She was getting dangerously depressed and had pretty much stopped going to school at this point. She was just so consumed by her stress and anxiety, she couldn't do anything. When I heard my parents talking about all of this, I snapped. I burst into tears in front of them, and they were confused as to why. My mother asked what happened, and I told them everything. I was the one behind it all. That's why the police located the device in our house. It was my computer they were picking up. I just got so tired of living in her shadow. It's like no one even cared about me when she was around. Compared to her, I was always the bad apple in the family. Every time I tried to make something out of myself, Emma always took the spotlight with her success. I wanted her to feel how I always felt. Miserable. Getting the money from Emma was just a bonus to everything. I was the manipulator, and I was the one that took advantage of her. It was all easy, too. All I had to do was pose as this perfect guy for her to fall in love with. I already knew exactly what she was interested in and what type of personality she has, so it worked out perfectly. I just never expected it to get this far. I just really wanted her to look at life from the other side, where the grass isn't always green. My parents couldn't believe what I admitted to. They demanded that I leave their house immediately, and after their harsh words, they refused to even speak to me. It took almost a year for my mother to finally get back into contact with me and forgive me, but my father still says nothing, and to be honest, I think I deserve it. When my sister found out what happened, she refused to speak with me as well, and our relationship has never recovered from this incident. Fortunately, my sister was able to recover mostly from it. However, she has never fully been the same since. I really hope that one day I will regain her trust and that we can be sisters again. Hi, my name is Martin, and I would like to share with you my creepy Instagram horror story. 
I've never expected that protecting others could backfire on you so quickly. I've come so close to death, and I now realize how lucky I was to survive this incident. I hope you all hear me out till the end, and watch out next time you open up Instagram. So this story happened about four years ago, when I was still in high school. I was living in a rather small town in Pennsylvania, but there were many kids attending our school from nearby towns and countryside areas. I remember it as a fun time. I had many friends, and I was invited to many awesome parties. I also had a girlfriend back then, and I could say I was pretty happy with my life. But the good times changed when I met Christopher. He was a tall, well-built guy with a good head of hair, but he had these thick rimmed glasses. Those glasses made him look almost like a cartoon character. They were often falling off his nose and he would constantly try to put them back in place. It was funny to me. Sometimes even I was scolded by a teacher for laughing at him. Even though I was laughing at Christopher, we became friends from the very start. He actually transferred from another school because his father changed jobs and started a new one close to our town. On the day of his arrival, I was sitting alone at my desk at the end of the classroom. I just liked my personal space, so I rarely sat with anyone in my classes. When he entered, the teacher assigned him the only desk available, which just so happened to be the one next to mine. I greeted him and actually found him quite nice from the beginning. We talked a lot and even spent our lunch break together. It appeared that we had so much in common. He showed me his video game collection and told me he was really into League of Legends, something of which I played a lot back then. After some time, I invited him to my house for a sleepover. The day of the sleepover, we planned to grab some snacks and drinks from the store and watch movies on my bedroom couch. I had a big TV in my room so it was a perfect place to talk, watch TV, and play some games. And that's what we did. But before we started a movie, we gossiped a lot about our classmates and our conversation eventually drifted to the topic of girls. That's when I got really creepy vibes from him. Wait, what do you mean profit from it? You gotta check this out. I've created this Instagram page where I upload photos of those- I get money from random guys from our school. They donate me money for every photo. They even make suggestions for me for which girl should be next. I just had to upload images of them in embarrassing or kinky situations. I mean, for example, I try to follow them around to the bathroom or hide in a girl's locker room just to get a perfect shot of them without a bra. It gives me so much excitement I earn so much cash because of it. <laughs> My heart started to race, and I felt instantly unsafe when he showed me this page. There are many lewd photos of girls that I recognize from our high school. Many of the pictures were certainly taken from some kind of hiding spot, which I knew for sure was breaking the law. Some of the pictures were taken from above the restroom stalls, or even under it. They showed a lot of intimate parts, as well as things like defecation. I couldn't believe this harmless, nice guy I was friends with for quite a bit of time actually turned out to be such a stalker. I never wished any of those girls found out about this page, and from what I could see, it was very popular. There are many comments from some of my Instagram friends that I go to school with, they're mostly dirty comments, posted by some horny nerd guys that would never even have the guts to approach these women. I was horrified and scared. I could see a big smile on his face and didn't see any remorse from him that would even signify that he knew what he was doing was wrong. He was only laughing and he got worked up from it. He really hated those women and I didn't know why. I immediately wanted him out of my house and came up with an idea to report it to the principal. But I decided to play along and pretend it's funny, because he was way bigger than me, and I didn't know what he would do to me after I tell him what I really think of it. Even my parents were out of town that weekend, so I really didn't know where to even seek help from. The rest of the day was spent playing games and watching movies. But I kept my guard up and was really anxious for the rest of the sleepover. The next day, I immediately went to the school and told everything to the principal. 
He instantly called the police and thanked me for my report. It was a serious misdemeanor, and he told me that he certainly would be suspended. And I suppose that's what happened, because I didn't see him the next day at school. But I noticed some of the girls in my classroom were absent too. I later learned from one of my friends that the officers revealed this page for some of the students to confirm that the photos were made without their knowledge or consent. I can only imagine how shocking and embarrassing that was for them. I even later found that some of those students experienced major trauma, which is why they stayed home from school. They had been crying every day for weeks on end. Obviously, the page was blocked by Instagram almost immediately after the police got involved. Upon further investigation from the school, Christopher was eventually expelled. For my own safety, I blocked him on every social media and his phone number. I hadn't heard anything from him for at least three months. That was until one Friday evening. I was chilling in my room, playing League of Legends, when suddenly I heard a loud noise outside my bedroom window. Chills ran down my spine. It sounded like someone stepped on a tree branch and broke it. The first thing that came to my mind was that it was an intruder. I was once again alone at my house, so I started to panic. My parents had this big new house, so there was a higher chance that it could become a target for any thieves. I ultimately decided that it is better to leave my house to protect my safety. I thought to pretend that I had to leave to go to the store, so I put my shoes and baseball hat on. And as soon as I left the house, I saw a figure in black hiding behind the bushes. I don't know why, but I suddenly froze and couldn't move. I only stared at this figure that began to now slowly stand up. I could finally now see who it was. It was Christopher, but I almost couldn't recognize his appearance. He had a lot of his hair chopped off and looked like he cut himself with a knife he was holding in his hand. Suddenly. He charged at me with the knife. I thought I was going to die in this moment. I literally didn't move an inch and didn't understand what was going on around me. He knocked me over and stabbed me in the stomach. He was yelling at me. Some of the words went like, You've left me no other choice than to kill you. You've single-handedly destroyed my life. I had never experienced something as painful as this. My mind finally realized what was happening, and I instinctively threw his body off my own and onto the grass. I then stood up and ran towards my neighbor's house. Christopher followed suit, but he couldn't keep up with me. Thankfully, my neighbor had his front door unlocked. I didn't even bother knocking first. I just entered his house, slamming shut his door and locking it behind me. He was sitting in the living room, shocked and confused especially when he saw blood coming from my stomach. I explained to him what had happened, and he called 911, asking for the police and an ambulance. I just remember feeling so dizzy. I fainted, but I awoke several minutes later, and when I did wake up, I was surrounded by police and the paramedics, while Christopher was apprehended and sitting in a police car. Thankfully, I didn't have any life-threatening injuries. I recovered from the stabbing wounds and was left with a nasty scar on my stomach. I testified against him, and after a few months, I found he got six years for attempted murder. Like many of the girls at my school, I was left with major trauma from Christopher. I still don't understand why he held me responsible for destroying his life when I was only doing what was right. I joined Instagram many years ago as a little girl. Every one of my other friends had Instagram, so I thought to download it as well just for fun. In the beginning, it was just like Facebook. I used it to contact people and see their posts on my front page. I really loved how Instagram worked and got addicted to it really fast. I then started to post my own pictures and noticed how I got the most likes out of the rest of my girlfriends. I've always known that I've been relatively attractive because I've always got the boys' attention in my school. I had a tall, slim figure with bright blue eyes and silky hair. At first, I had my profile private, but my friends eventually talked me into making it public. 
They told me that it would bring in more followers, and more followers meant more likes, and more likes meant a higher opportunity to open doors for business proposals on Instagram. I followed their advice and made the switch. However, I didn't notice any new followers rolling in, so I eventually forgot about the whole thing. I thought maybe I wasn't meant out to be some kind of Instagram model. This all changed, however, when I went on a beach trip and decided to take some pictures when I was there. I ended up taking a few bikini pictures of myself, but it wasn't anything too revealing. All it mainly showed was some of my cleavage. I decided to post these pictures on Instagram, thinking only my girlfriends would see it. But all of a sudden, I received so many likes and comments from strangers. I forgot that I still had my profile public. I panicked at first, trying to delete the post as soon as I could, but when I noticed how my follower account was skyrocketing, I saw some major potential and thought that I could make some money off my newfound popularity. From then on, I was posting like crazy, and my profile was growing faster and faster every week. It didn't take long before someone DM'd me with a business proposal. It was for a drink advertisement, and after signing an online contract, I was supposed to travel to a specific photo shoot location and take pictures with their product. I was going to reel in a really nice amount of money for this gig, and I was so excited that I immediately accepted the offer. I told my parents about it, and they're really excited for me too. The photo shoot was supposed to take place in a bigger, more popular city than our own. However, I told them that the photo shoot was located within our own city, so they wouldn't worry as much. When I arrived at the location, I noticed a really handsome guy in a suit. He introduced himself as one of the agents of the company and asked me if I would like to grab a drink and talk about the full scope of our arrangement. I was confused at first, but didn't think much of it and just assumed that this is the way business is done. He offered to buy my drink, to which I agreed to because nothing tastes better than a free drink. However, when I got down to a little less than half the glass left, I didn't feel good at all. My head began spinning and I think I passed out because I don't remember anything else from there. I woke up in what only I can assume to be some kind of dark basement. I couldn't see much, but the first thing I did notice was that I was bound and gagged. I could even scream for help if I tried. When my eyes finally became adapted to the darkness, I noticed that there are two other girls tied up in that room with me. Both of them were unconscious, and one of them looked like a corpse rather than a living person because of how pale she was. I'd never been so scared before. My mind finally realized what had happened to me. I was kidnapped and locked in a basement, and I didn't know what to do. The kidnappers, whoever they were, took my wallet and my phone as well, and I instantly regretted not telling my parents the actual location of my supposed photo shoot. I was completely hopeless. All I could do was stare at that basement door and wait for someone to open it. I was staring for what seemed to be like a few hours, but nobody came. All of a sudden, I hear what sounds to be like police sirens getting closer and closer till finally they were so loud I knew they were right outside the house I was being held captive in. I couldn't believe my luck. It was the happiest moment of my entire life. The police entered the house and eventually made their way to the basement. They untied all of us and the paramedics came to take us to the hospital. Thankfully, I was able to recover from all this physically and most of it mentally. The pale girl, on the other hand, wasn't so fortunate, as she later died. The officers that first responded to the scene eventually told me that they got an anonymous tip from someone saying that they spotted a man in a suit dropping pills into my drink. I also found out that the man who pretended to be an agent was actually connected to human trafficking and planned to smuggle us out of the country. This turned out to be the most terrifying day of my life, and I have never again accepted any business proposal that I had to do in person. So, this happened about four years ago. I'm 21 years old and no longer living in the neighborhood. I saw the neighbor in question yesterday when I was visiting my parents and that's when I remembered what had happened. 
A little bit of backstory. I live in a third world country. Our neighborhood is one of the worst ones, but only for outsiders. We're actually pretty friendly towards each other. Even people fresh out of jail are typically pretty friendly. We got a lot of mental cases in our neighborhood, and Happy is one of them. My mother and I call him Happy because his name literally means happy, and we always joke around saying, Oh, Happy, are you happy? Because he's usually always smiling. That is, unless someone angers him, which is at least three times a year. I lived there for about 19 years, so I know how he is. Happy lives with his two brothers. One sells fruits, and the other is a taxi driver. Happy doesn't work because he's mentally ill. I think he has some type of schizophrenia, but I'm not really sure which one. All I know is he just doesn't really function right. You can't really hold a conversation with him on sports or the news or really anything. His sentences just never make sense. I should also say that our country doesn't really take mental illnesses very seriously. We've got like three psych wards in the entire country. There's just no way of treatment for him. And whatever he is, people just refer to him as crazy. It's honestly really sad. My dad was actually friends with him and his brothers. Not anymore, though. My dad used to give him money from time to time so that he could buy himself smokes. My dad knew that his brother, the taxi driver, needed to support his two kids in another city, and the fruit seller barely sells his goods. Happy used to help carry the groceries sometimes, and dad would give him some change for it. So, since I was a kid, I only know the Happy who was very helpful and friendly, and I always smiled at him, and he would smile back at me. Well, when I turned 15 years old, he had completely changed. He still had the smile on his face, and he would stand outside in different places in the shed all day long smoking. I used to wake up at about 7am to go to school, and I would see him outside wide awake just smoking. He either didn't sleep or just woke up way too early. He would also walk some long distances as well. We would see him in a place where it takes us about half an hour to go by car, so imagine how long it took him by foot to get there. He seemed restless, but mostly he would just stand there and smoke. It ranged from early mornings to very late at nights. The behavior change became pretty creepy. He would always stare at me and have a creepy kind of forced smile on his face. If I passed by him, he would always follow me with his eyes, to the point that he would walk backwards and keep staring. I glanced a couple of times to know that he does this every time. He would also walk backwards and then put his back up against the walls like he was hiding or something. His whole demeanor just totally changed. His anger and fits also became more frequent. He would shout some cursing phrases that made no sense whatsoever and walk angrily towards his house. Now to what actually happened to me. As I said, he would always follow me with his eyes and all that. I was 17 years old and out of any day, the day of the incident that I happened to be home alone. I didn't go out with the family because I had to study. He probably knew that I was alone because whenever my family left, I saw through the window that he was standing in his usual spot and just staring at them while they were driving off. Lunchtime came, so I went to go buy some stuff to cook. I spotted him standing next to his brother that sells the fruit at the local market. I went to the market to buy some veggies and meat. The vegetables were pretty close to where Happy was, but the butcher was a minute walk away. As I paid the butcher for my purchase and putting it into my bag, I look up and there Happy was just staring at me. I didn't really think much of it, so I turned to the right and just kept walking towards the house, but he was right behind me yet again. I still didn't think much of it, again, because our houses are literally right next to each other. I passed his house and I was waiting to hear his footsteps to stop, but no. He was still right behind me. I look and his eyes are still on me with that really creepy smile. Still, I didn't really care because I just thought that he was going right to his spot that he usually stands at to light a cigarette or something. I never really felt like I was in any danger in my neighborhood, so I'm not really the type to get anxious easily and especially by happy. 
I never really felt that he was the dangerous type, even during his rage fits, so that's why I really had no red flags. I entered the main door from the street and walked in the wide rectangular hall that had one door where an old woman lives, passing her door and turning right to climb the stairs to get to my house that was on the second floor. I heard someone enter the main door and in the hall. Again, I just thought it was one of the neighbors from the third floor. The footsteps were really quick though, so I thought that one of them was in a hurry, so I turned to look at the bottom of the stairs to see who it was and make some room so that they could climb fast. To my shock, it was none other than Happy on the bottom of the stairs. I stopped dead in my tracks and that's when my heart just started pounding really fast. I said, Happy, what are you doing here? With no response, he started bolting right towards me, taking two steps at a time. I started climbing faster too and he caught my foot and I slipped. My right arm and knee were in so much pain from the fall. He was dragging me to the bottom of the stairs and that messed up my back as well. But with all the adrenaline pumping through my veins, I started kicking to release my ankle from his two hands and then screaming for him to get off. I also screamed out help, hoping one of the neighbors would hear me and come for my rescue. With my free leg, I started kicking his forearm so that he would let go and then kept kicking and shaking the other leg free as well. With a bit of luck, I finally got free. I couldn't turn though and I started climbing afraid that he would follow to the house and God only knows what he would do if he got inside. I really just wanted to kick him and hopefully make him just lose balance and fall off the stairs to give me enough time to go inside my house. I kicked and kicked but with no luck and screaming. It felt like forever but it was probably about 5 seconds and I then heard the door of the old lady downstairs begin to open. Happy heard it too so he fled out of there. Happy passed her house, so of course she saw him, and she actually shouted at him, but he didn't listen. She was calling my name and asking if I'm okay, but I couldn't respond. She popped her head up from the bottom of the stairs, still calling my name, but all I could really do was just cry in terror and pain. My elbow was bleeding, and she started calling for my mom's name. I told her that nobody was home, so she asked me to get in her house so she could help take care of my bleeding. I told her it was okay and that I'd just do it myself but she refused and kept calling me to go down but eventually I just ignored her and hardly climbed those stairs and got inside. After about an hour or so, I got myself cleaned up, calmed down a bit and cautiously went to the old lady's house. I knocked and she opened and I asked her not to tell anything to my parents because if my dad knew he would probably literally kill the guy. I told her that Happy was just crazy and my dad shouldn't go to jail for someone who's crazy and he probably wasn't in his right mind. I eventually talked her into believing that he was out of his mind and that it's not that serious. She promised that she wouldn't say anything to my family and that was that. The next two years, he changed again completely. This time, however, he wouldn't even look me in the eyes. If I was walking and he was walking towards me, he would literally turn around and not pass near me. The first couple of months I was really afraid that he would be waiting around a corner or something, but turns out he just doesn't want to be seen by me. Even after me moving out and us not seeing each other whenever I visit, and to this day, four years later, he still doesn't want to be seen by me. So happy. I hope you stay that way and don't hurt any other girls from the neighborhood. But what I really hope for the most is mental illness awareness in my country. I really hope that people start getting treatments and the right care. People like Happy really need it. This all happened 15 years ago. I was about 19 years old when I was offered a job by my cousin to work for our uncle's glass business. They installed giant glass windows into tall buildings and skyscrapers. Not that it's too relevant to the story, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The catch to the job was that I had to temporarily move to Destin, Florida from Tampa. My cousin lived in Russellville, Alabama, and I really wanted to go visit the family there and leave with them together to go back down to Destin. Now, this was my first long distance road trip, and my very first trip away from my immediate family. Back then, I was driving a green Mercury Sable a car barely capable of getting groceries back home, 
but in my invincible youth, I didn't really care about that. I was just so pumped to be spreading my wings and getting out into the real world that the risks didn't really concern me. My mom and dad had tried to get me to plan and pack better, knowing the trip could have its pitfalls. But I mean, it wasn't like the trip was going to last days. And also, fast food exists, so I wasn't really stressing out about that. I mean, I'm not stupid. I packed for the trip, and I'm going to be staying there for a few months in Destin. But they were really adamant on me bringing food, water, emergency supplies, etc. I declined because it wasn't the 1930s, and of course there's gas stations at every exit, and I had a Razor flip phone. My way of thinking was, what could possibly happen on two busy interstates? It wasn't like I was going to some far off country with no cell service. Anyways, fast forward to the trip. I'm a Florida boy. So I had no idea Alabama could get so cold, and I also had no idea that the heat was broken in my car. I had never really used it. At first I'm thankful because by the time I reach Alabama, I'm tired as hell, and I had made a lot more stops than I anticipated. I still had a few hours to go, and the cold air was keeping me wide awake. Finally I pull off the interstate and I start heading through these smaller numbered roads. The roads didn't really have conventional names like in Florida. They were just numbered, which I kind of found odd. After driving on those a bit, I started being sent down gravel roads. This was the days of MapQuest, so I didn't have a GPS guiding me through the just paved roads or rerouting me around roadblocks. I was starting to get really hungry and I thought back to my parents telling me to pack food. I really should have listened. The sketchiest thing with MapQuest was that you just printed out the directions, so you didn't really have a map to fall back on. So going out of your way to find fast food at an exit came with the potential of legitimately getting lost. So I had basically passed a few times to turn off for food because I was tired and I just didn't want to chance it. Instead, however, I was looking for something off the side of the road that I could easily pull in and then back out with no fuss. But more importantly, no risk of getting lost. My prayers were answered a little down the road when I saw a beat up old country grocery store on my right hand side. It didn't even have a name, it just said grocery right across the front of the white building. I pulled in because the light shining across the grocery sign was on, but found it odd that most of the lights inside were off. I'm not gonna lie, this gave me the creeps a little, but it didn't stop me from going up to the door. I was really starving and maybe this was a 24 hour place but I wasn't sure. I saw a shadow move across the back of the long aisles as I approached the glass door and surprisingly opened it with ease. At this point, I was honestly half expecting them to be closed due to the lack of lighting inside, and I was really hoping that the owner would take pity on a tired traveler and let me grab some snacks. I then called out, Hello? Anyone here? No one answered. I then said something along the lines of, I saw you when I pulled up, and I was hoping you're still open. Again, no answer. Now, this was really naive of me, but I assumed that maybe the owner was just older or something and maybe he couldn't hear me, or that maybe he was deaf, so I went further back into the store. It honestly didn't really smell that great inside there, and I had hoped that they at least had some chips or something. At least those are sealed. Suddenly, a man emerged from the back. Oh, I'm so sorry. We were just about to close. How can I help you? He asked with a smile. He clearly made me jump out of my skin at first, but he seemed friendly enough. Not the old man I was picturing before, but actually a much younger guy. Maybe in his 30s. Yeah, I just came up from Florida. It's been a long drive. I was kind of hoping you guys had something to eat for the trip. Oh, we have plenty. What are you looking for exactly? He said without taking his eyes off me. The guy had a really weird unblinking stare that just really put me on edge. But what made me the most uncomfortable was his smile. He smiled big but his eyes never moved. As in the only way you could tell he was conveying an emotion was by looking at his mouth. The rest of his face stayed the same. Most people you could tell they're smiling even if their mouth was covered. Because you smile with your whole face. But not this guy. Yeah, I just wanted some chips, maybe a Coke. Do you have any Doritos? Of course, he said, walking past me. 
He locked the door behind me before turning and smiling. I don't want anyone else walking in. He chuckled. Him locking the door was really creepy, but I just shrugged it off because the reasoning was pretty sound, even though it felt off. Follow me, the guy said as he walked towards the back of the store. I was young, but I really should have been smart enough to know that the store owners generally don't give customers a tour of the store, but I had lived a pretty sheltered life. I could feel that something was off, but I didn't want to offend him by asking questions like, what's that smell, and other things. We get to the back of the store to where those plastic flaps hang that separate the customer side and the back end. When the man sticks his hand through, parting through the plastic, then saying, right this way. Now alarm bells are starting to go off in my head, especially as he starts looking around and past me like someone who's selling drugs and trying to watch out for the police. Uh, back there? I ask and start to back up a little. That's when I then notice chips right beside me on the aisle. The guy noticed me see the chips and then says, Yeah, back here. We got all our good stuff in the back. You can come take your pick. By this time, I had found the source of the buzzing. Flies are flying over the meat section, and the dim light that's reflecting off the packaging lets me know that it's been sitting there a while. I'll just take this if that's alright. I say nervously as I grab a bag off the shelf next to me, and then start backing up towards the door. Trust me, those are no good. I have way better stuff back here. He smiles again, gesturing for me to head back. I fake pat my pockets, then saying, Oh man, I think I forgot my wallet in my car. I'll be right back. As soon as the words left my lips, I then spun around and did a light jog to the front, increasing with speed as I approached the door. I make it to the door and twist the lock a couple times until I hear the click. I push the door open and turn back to look at where the man is, but he's gone. I jumped into that car and sped the fuck out of that parking lot and didn't stop again until I reached my cousin's house. This was by far one of the eeriest and creepiest things that have ever happened to me. This happened when I was 7 years old with my twin sister and mother. We had just entered our local grocery store, Surefine, when a man no more than 10 feet in front of us glanced over and immediately whipped his head back towards us. Now as a quick side note, my twin and I at that age were always dressed in matching dresses, and we had long blonde hair that had always got us looks of alls and affection, but this was different. He was a bulky middle-aged man of mid-eastern descent, and it stopped what he was doing to fully look at us up and down. A really husky smile crossed his scruffy face. My mother paid no mind to this, as she was no stranger to creepy men herself. I immediately grumbled to my twin Cass how creepy it was the way the man was looking at us. So as we turned left to start going through the aisles, Cass and I turned and we saw the man walking toward us with his shopping cart. When we first made eye contact, he immediately turned his attention to a table with baked goods on it, which kind of stood out to Cass and I more than if he had just kept walking normally. So my mother's obviously shopping and Cass and I just keep glancing back and we keep catching the man at the end of every aisle that we enter just staring with no expression on his face, and even from a slight distance, he was seemingly breathing like really weirdly. I also noticed that his cart continues to remain empty, except for the baked goods that he grabbed when we had first looked back at him. We tell my mother, but she just rolls her eyes at us and tells us that he probably thinks we're following him, because we keep looking at him. The man disappears as we hit the last of the aisles, and Cass and I are already on a completely different topic by now. When we're heading for the registers, having almost completely forgotten about him within minutes. We're about to make it to the register when my sister asks my mom for a candy bar, and I quickly join to which she then angrily replies that we don't have the money for it. We're both pouting at this point and she threatens to leave us as she begins putting things on the conveyor belt. But then Cass and I watch my mother turn to face us again, when her expression completely changes and her eyes shift behind us. It's the man. He's sweating profusely at this point, and he's literally less than like a foot behind us. Cass and I immediately take a step forward towards our mother. The man laughs awkwardly, then apologizes, saying, Sorry ma'am, I didn't mean to scare you girls. You're all just so beautiful. 
These girls, are they yours? My mother kind of scoffs to this and then goes, Yeah, they're mine. And he does that same awkward laugh again, then saying, I couldn't help but notice that you don't have the money to get them what they want. How old are they, and you as well? I could help you. I have lots of money. Money's no problem for me. My mother's face then furrows in confusion and annoyance, then snapping. Um, excuse me? Like clockwork, he laughs again like it's some big joke, then says, I'm serious, how much? My mother stares at him blankly for a moment, and he continues, How much for the girls? I'd like both of them, but if you could only part with one, I could still make that work. I'll give you the money. Just name your price, and I can give them anything they want. Any candy they want. He grins yet again and wipes his brow, looking down at us. My mother doesn't respond to him, just looks at us and growls, Here. Now. So we do as we were told, which was fine by us because we didn't want to be anywhere near this creepy man. The cashier was a teenage girl no older than 17, and she was just completely wide-eyed watching this conversation occur as she silently continues to scan our groceries. Once we were next to my mother, she then growls at the man. If you so much as lay one fucking finger on my kids, I'll break it off and shove it down your throat. Which were some pretty big words coming from my 4 foot 11 mother. But the man's face darkens, and without even purchasing anything, he walks around the cash register and exits, but he doesn't get far. The entire front of the store is glass, so moments later we watch as he presses his face against the glass trying to see in leaving a sweaty face print behind. Now, at this point, the cashier's alerting her manager and asking him to call the police. My mother immediately assures them that that's not necessary and just asks the manager to walk us out to her car. We see no sign of the man as we unload our groceries and hop into the car. My mother quickly drives us home once we sit in the car for a few minutes, scanning for any signs that he might be waiting in a car or something. We eventually made it home safely and nothing ever came of it. I don't know what happened to the man, but I truly hope he never convinced anyone to give him their kid. That's absolutely horrific to think about. This happened about four years ago. I was 20 years old at the time. The first time I met the guy who had become my grocery store stalker, he was standing outside the store collecting money for the Salvation Army's Christmas time donations. I'm a fairly friendly person so I like to say hi to people who work at places I frequent just to be nice. This guy was a kid around my age, very tall, with a mild resemblance to Lurch from the Adams family. Dark circles under dark eyes, short black hair, and a kind of vacant look in his eyes. I chatted with him for maybe about two minutes, kind of just idle chit-chat about the weather and whatnot. Nothing particularly memorable or interesting. I then waved goodbye and went home. Little did I know that that single moment would be the start of something that would have me genuinely afraid. About four or five months passed and I hadn't seen him again. Then one day as I was grocery shopping with a friend when, as we were chatting, she suddenly got really quiet and kind of recoiled backwards, then looking behind me. I turned around to see this guy who had to be at least six foot four towering over me, not eight inches from my body. He said hi and he told me that he remembered from that December that I had talked to him and then asked for my number. I, being young and had never really experienced this type of interaction before, told him that I didn't have my number memorized but that I would write his down and then maybe text him later. I kinda half waved my phone at him pointing at my at the time boyfriend whose picture was my wallpaper, making a point to say, oh look, that's my boyfriend, to the guy hoping he would clue in, but no luck. He told me his number which immediately upon getting I blocked without letting him get my number. However, what really made my blood run cold was what he said to me after I put my phone away. He leaned in real close to me and in a really low voice then told me, Whatever I text you is for your eyes only. I start to feel genuinely uncomfortable at this point. I said back, Uh, yeah, sure. It was nice talking to you but we gotta get back to shopping. And I grabbed my friend and dragged her off, shooting a panicked look at her and asking her why she didn't bail me out. Apparently, he scared her too with him getting so close to me, and she just didn't know what to do. I also want to make it clear that I'm not exactly a small girl. I'm 5'8 and solidly built, 
I can certainly handle myself, and I very rarely ever feel intimidated or small in the presence of anyone, male or female. But this guy, he really made me feel tiny and scared. In the months that would follow, he would make me feel truly frightened. I had really hoped that that creepy interaction would be the last time I saw him, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. After that initial meeting with him saying that creepy thing about his text being for my eyes only, it seemed like I would run into him every single time that I got into the store. No matter what checkout lane I was in, he always seemed to appear at the end of it when I was finished shopping, and every time I was in the store, I would always notice him out of the corner of my eye watching me, no matter what area I was in. One time I even caught him following me out to my car. At that point I got scared and I finally decided to say something to the managers. After letting all the managers know what was going on, they then assured me that they would tell him not to talk to me. After that he wouldn't speak to me, but I would continue to see him following me around the store at a distance every single time I went up there. It got so bad and I felt so terrified that I started to be afraid to go to the store at all. But I'm one of those stubborn people who refuses to be intimidated by someone to the point where I'll stop doing something. I had really hoped that maybe it was just a coincidence that he was following me. After all, it was a really big store, and maybe he just had things to do that just happened to be in the same area as I was shopping in, so I started to pay close attention to my surroundings. Once I started really paying attention, I realized that every single time I was up there, I would constantly notice him in the same areas in the store that I was in. During my last encounter with him, I had went to the store to just grab two or three items that I needed for dinner that night. And I first saw him standing at the store when I got there, and with his bag facing me, I quickly ran inside, hoping he didn't see me. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, I had saw him at the very back of the store, and items in hand, I immediately made a beeline towards the front. As soon as I got near the checkout, I ducked behind one of the shelf displays and watched carefully at the front of the store to see if the creepy guy would appear. I watched as he looked up and down at the checkout, and when he didn't see me there, I saw him step outside. At this point, I quickly ran to the nearest open cashier, rang up all my items, and then stuck my head out the door to look for him. I didn't see him there immediately, so I started trying to make my way back to where I was parked. I had parked a little ways away near the side of the store where a bunch of other small stores and restaurants were lined up at, and I was walking towards my car. I realized then that I saw him standing by the entrance that I had first entered the store through, and then dug behind a pillar immediately, hoping he didn't see me. I watched carefully from behind the pillar, and as he scanned the parking lot, he obviously couldn't find me. After a minute or two, he started to walk out towards the direction of the parking lot in front of the store, and so I took that opportunity to make a run for it to my car as soon as that he was far enough away that I felt safe. As soon as I got into my car, I then locked the doors, and to my horror when I looked up, he was standing there about 15 feet from my car with a shopping cart in front of him. I knew that he followed me and he knew that I knew. I fully believed that he had chased after me, and when I made it to my car, he grabbed the nearest cart to make it look like he was collecting them from the parking lot. I remember just feeling absolutely terrified at that moment. I went home, and I immediately told my grandfather what had just happened. I began crying and shaking, and my grandfather told me to get in the car. Well, we're going to settle this. He and I drove up to the store in his car, and he walked me into the store and demanded we spoke with the managers immediately, both of them. When the managers arrived at customer service, he asked me to tell them what had been happening and demanded that they ensure he left me alone or that he would involve the police. The managers swore up and down they would take care of it. As far as I know, he wasn't fired immediately because my friend who first encountered him with me when this whole thing began told me that she would see him from time to time when she was there by herself, but that any time I went with her, she would never see him. I fully believed that he knew whenever I was there, only this time instead of stalking me, he avoided me. Eventually, everyone who knew the situation stopped seeing him there, so I think he may have gotten fired or moved on from that store. Either way, I haven't had any issues since, but I've never in my life felt so afraid of another human being as I did that day, seeing him make eye contact with me in the parking lot as I locked my car doors. It still really creeps me out to think that he was watching me so closely every time I entered the store that he could so easily avoid or follow me whenever he wanted. So yeah, I was stalked every time I went grocery shopping for four months straight, and I never want to experience that ever again. 
I worked as a Walmart cashier for a little over a year. I quit in August of 2015 when I went away to college. As a cashier, you see a lot of people in a day, especially at Walmart. And after a while, you don't even see people's faces when you look at them, but there are some people that you see so often you start to recognize and sometimes learn their names. There was this one guy, always in the same Green Bay Packers hoodie and Chicago Cubs baseball cap, that would often seek out my line no matter how long it was, just so he could stare at me and rarely say a word. Whenever he did say anything to me, he would always lean across the register to get closer to my face. He always gave me a really bad vibe, but when I asked other cashiers about him, they said that he had never been weird around them. One of the girls even said he was a close family friend. After that, I dropped the issue. One night after I'd been there for about a year, I was working a 2 to 11 shift. Those shifts were always the worst because you'd be there for three, sometimes four front end managers, but also because it takes the chunk out of your day when you were actually going to do anything. So I'm down on the self-checkout. It's about 10.15, so I'm counting the minutes until I can shut it down at 10 to 11. The creepy guy comes in the front door and makes a beeline for me at the self-check podium. When I see him come in, I instantly get nervous. He walks up and says, Can I still buy a cell phone card and electronics? I told him I only worked as a cashier on the front end, so I didn't know anything about electronics, but he could go back and check. He seemed peeved by this answer, but he walked away without another word. About 10 minutes later, he comes up with a prepaid phone card and said there's no one at the register in electronics, so I activate his card and hand it to him, telling him to have a good night, but he pushes the card back at me without saying a word and I say, is something wrong? To which he replies, these minutes aren't on my phone yet, are they? I was confused by this statement because of course they weren't. He had just bought the card. I shook my head and he waved the card in front of my face. Why the fuck are you just standing there? Reactivate my phone. When he talked, he was so close I could smell his breath and I was a little scared. I wanted to put in a call to my manager so that someone could come down and help me. This is where I should probably mention that I'm about 5 foot 3 and he is closer to probably 6 foot 5 and very stocky so he was towering over me and the thought that he could easily overpower me crossed my mind, but I get so nervous whenever men yell or cuss at me because my dad was never the type to yell or cuss. I took the card out of his hand and he slammed his cell phone on the scanner. I was trying not to let him know I was nervous, but I was terrified. I knew I had never put minutes on a prepaid phone before, but I don't dare tell him that in fear of what he might do. So I read the directions, pick up his phone, dial the number, and as I'm putting in the card number, his phone runs out of minutes. I try to call back and get an error message. I'm at a loss. I meekly hand him his phone back and say, I'm sorry, something went wrong. I don't know what is happening. As soon as I say it, he takes his phone, opens it up, tries to dial someone, and when it doesn't work, he looks at me with furious eyes. He screams. His voice is echoing in the store and unfortunately we haven't gotten the end of second shift rush yet, so there is no one around. He closes his phone and opens it again, trying to make another call, but when it doesn't work, he throws the phone down on the scanner again. But this comes much more quietly, practically a whisper. At this point, I'm worried he's going to put his hands on me, and I don't know what to do. I put in a call for a manager from my register, and then I say, I've called someone that might be able to help but we're at shift change right now so it might be faster for you to take it to the customer service desk. He picks up his phone off the podium, still mumbling and I'm hoping I can get out of there before he comes back or at least have someone else down at the self-check with me. Another 15 minutes go by and I don't see him again. As I'm picking up items that people left by the registers, getting ready to shut them down for the night, he comes back and stands by the podium. He still looks completely pissed off and my stomach has sank. He made that finger motion that means come here without saying anything and for some reason that makes me even more nervous. When I'm standing in front of him, he leans so close to my face that I think he's about to kiss me or bite me or God knows what. I try to take a step back but he takes a step forward when I do. A creepy grin comes across his face as he says, The girl up there fixed it. 
simple fix. But next time, I expect you to know what to do. Understand? I nod because I don't think I can speak. He gets impossibly closer before saying, I'm sorry I raised my voice. I never should have done that. Especially to a pretty girl like you. When he adds the last part, he lightly uses his fingertips to brush my bangs to the side. I took a step back and he said, Let me make it up to you. Let me buy you a drink. I shake my head, I say, No thank you, I'm only 19. He says, So we'll get a couple of beers and go back to my place. Again, I shake my head. No, it's really okay. I'm not much of a drinker. I have an early morning tomorrow. He looks displeased with this answer and says, Tell you what, I'll wait over here by the door just in case you change your mind. I smile at him weakly and tell him to have a good night. When I see him walk through the security, I quickly shut down the registers and sign out of mine. Then I run over to find a manager to tell about the whole thing. The third shift manager that I tell looks at me like I'm lying, and when I'm finished says, I know Todd, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he doesn't have it in him, you're probably just being dramatic. She then turns to another older cashier behind her, shakes her head and mumbles, teenagers. I ask if I can have someone to walk me to my car and they tell me that management is in a meeting and the security guy went home already, so I clocked out and went to the bathroom. I waited in the bathroom for about 10 minutes before coming out and attempting to go to my car. When I walked around the corner through the security things, he wasn't sitting on the bench right there like I had been expecting. I relaxed a little before I realized he was standing just outside the door, far enough away to keep it from closing, smoking a cigarette. He has his back turned toward the door. Luckily, I never went out the front door so I always went to the corridor and not the side door. I quietly closed the door behind me so maybe I wouldn't catch his attention. I rushed to my car which was fortunately very close to the building. As I'm quick walking to my car I hear him shout, Hey, why are you avoiding me? Come here. At this point, I take off into a full on sprint which is not easy because I'm wearing Sperry's so it's like running in clogs. I get to my car, get in, lock my door as I'm starting it and don't even bother with my seatbelt. By that point, He had made it almost all the way to my car and was still yelling, telling me he just wanted to talk. I took off as fast as I could and took the longest way home with the most turns and twists that I could. When I got home, I told my dad about the experience and he was so angry that no one had answered my calls or believed me he called the store manager the next day and complained. I was never contacted about his complaint. But from that night on, whenever I saw that guy I would run to the bathroom, or if I couldn't get away, I would put out my lane closed sign and turn off my light so he couldn't get in my line. You always hear people talking about the people of Walmart as being trashy, but they never tell you about the select few that are scary as hell. This happened to me when I was in 11th grade. I'm a female, and I tend to be a people pleaser. I never like to call anyone out, reject anyone outright, or act like someone is being weird. I'm also a bit open-minded, and I tend to go with the flow. School started in early September, and in my marine biology class, I noticed that there was this boy that kept staring at me from the corner of my eye. I just made one of those half smiles towards him to acknowledge him and went on about my assignment. I really did not think much of it for a couple of weeks, even though he continued to stare. He was very skinny and tall, had brown hair, his eyes were so brown that they looked black. He had a generally nondescript face other than his super dark eyes. One day he decided to say hi. I said hello back to him and he told me his name, which was Alex. I told him mine, but he said that he already knew my name. That wasn't a surprise, as I have rather large handwriting, and he could have easily watched me write my name down on one of my papers, since he was staring at me so much. 
It was kind of odd that he didn't really have any facial expression when he flatly said that he knew my name. I just sort of laughed it off, said, oh, okay, and began putting my things in my bag as the bell was about to ring. I only had a few friends, and we always sat at the same table during lunch. We were all rather quiet, and most times read while we ate. That means I usually don't look around the lunchroom, as I have my eyes in my book. This day, my friend finished her novel, so I decided to put mine away and just talk. I immediately noticed Alex staring inside at us from the courtyard tables. He never seemed to be embarrassed that I noticed him. I showed him to my friend and told her about my class with him. She found it to be super creepy, but I said he's probably harmless and was just socially awkward. I arrived in marine biology a little early later that day, and so it was just myself, Alex, and one other girl for about 10 minutes. I did that half smile at Alex and then decided to break out my book and start reading again. He had his hands folded over his mouth and was staring again. This time, it just felt awkward because we were basically alone now. I glanced over at him and kind of raised my eyebrows as if to say, yes. He looked me up and down very slowly and I asked him if he was okay. He said yes and that he was just inside of his head thinking, okay, whatever, that's fine. The next day at lunch, there was a little piece of paper on the table that we sat at. It had my name on the front. Not just my first name, my first and middle name. I opened it, and it said something like, I wonder what your asshole would look like with a PVC pipe shoved up it. What the fuck? I looked around. I didn't see Alex, but I immediately knew it was him. I was very scared to come to class later that day, but he wasn't there. I felt a lot better about not seeing him. The note itself was gross and embarrassing. I didn't want to show any administrators because of that, so I just threw it out. I went to the bus area at the end of the day, like usual, but this time, I noticed Alex leaning on one of the pillars with his backpack on one shoulder. I literally felt chills down my spine when I noticed a white PVC pipe poking out of the top of his backpack through the zippers. I didn't give him any reaction to my knowledge, even though I'm sure he had watched me read the note. The next morning, I made an appointment with a counselor and had my class changed. She was very reluctant to do that for me because we were already in the school year well over a month and a half. But I think since I have a history of good grades and behavior, she helped me out. I spent the rest of the year avidly avoiding him. He kept staring at me at lunchtime. And one time, he took photos of me at the bus area without my consent. Even though it was against school policy, I got some pepper spray for when I get off at my bus stop. I have no clue what happened to him, because when 12th grade began, he was no longer at our school. I'm not sure if I even want to know how he turned out. Number 2 So when I was a senior in high school, this would have been around 2007, I was out of the blue contacted one day by this random guy on MySpace. I vaguely recognized him, but I didn't know him. He told me that he knew me from school and that I had tutored him in math a couple of times. This should have been my first red flag that something was off. I hate math, and I've never tutored anyone on that topic. I told him that he was mistaken, but I tried to be nice to him and we struck up a friendly conversation. Soon, the guy, Brian, started talking to me at school. It started off pretty innocently. He was giving me more attention than I wanted from him, but I was kind of flattered by it, and I didn't really think much of it at the time. He was a couple of years younger than me, and I figured he had developed a crush on me primarily because we're both kind of odd compared to the other kids at our high school. It was a very small school. My graduating class was only about 40 people, and he and I were two of a very small number of alternative kids there. He was emo, 
while I tended to be more of the punk variety. Both of us loved My Chemical Romance. I figured he was into me because there weren't many other girls there with similar interests. Before long, he started waiting for me at my locker every day, between every class. He started following me around before school and during lunch. He started coming to my performances. I was in drama and choir. I tried to be polite, but started avoiding him. The situation continued to escalate to the point where he was sexually harassing me. Every chance I failed to avoid him. If he was waiting for me at my locker, he would say sexually explicit things to me, tell me what he wanted to do to me, and would also tell me that when he was having sex with his girlfriend, that he wished she was me. At homecoming, he left his girlfriend waiting awkwardly while he came to me and told me that he really wanted all of us to have a threesome. Luckily, my girlfriends were with me and came over as soon as they noticed him talking to me, which made him scurry away. As quickly as it started, it was over. One day, he stopped showing up at school. I was relieved but curious. After about a month of him being gone, my friend mentioned him in front of my dad who was also the principal of my high school. My dad asked me about what happened, and I ended up telling him the whole story. He seemed really troubled. I asked him what was wrong, and he told me why Brian was absent from school recently. Apparently, not long after homecoming, Brian had strapped some fireworks to a cat and set them off. The cat exploded, and Brian laughed. He got caught and was sent to jail and then was committed to a psychiatric facility by his parents after he was released. I don't know what happened to him after that. I'm thinking I dodged a bullet though, because he turned out to be even crazier than I thought he was. This happened when I was in high school. A few weeks in, I had made a few friends and I was keen on making more. So I would socialize a lot in the hopes that I would get more friends out of it. I was still somewhat new to the school and one day, I got lost. This is where I met the guy who would eventually become my stalker. He showed me around and helped me get to the class I needed to go to. And we made conversation and at first I thought he would be nice to have as a friend. A week passed and I had made a few more friends at this point. I wanted to hang out with him as much as I could. I felt a little bad because my other friend was a bit of a loner, so I invited him to come hang out with us. He didn't talk much at first, but after a while he eventually opened up to me, and then he wouldn't shut up. He mostly talked to me. He started asking me advice on life and whatnot, and I was happy to help. That is, until he started asking me to pat his head like a dog and make him wear a leash. It was a bit weird, you might say. I passed it off as a joke, and I humored him, something I never should have done. He started calling me his master, or mistress. I asked him not to do that, and I told him that I wasn't comfortable with this behavior, but it was apparently too late to fix things. He started skipping his classes to walk into and get kicked out of mine. He would follow me around all day, and if I would go to the restroom, guess who would follow me inside? I asked him to stop many, many times. He refused, so I tried to get the school involved. They had no proof of stalking, and I found that kind of strange since many of my teachers have kicked him out of my classes, but nevertheless, nothing happened. He began to get more aggressive when I asked one of my guy friends to help me out with a homework assignment. My stalker overheard this from around the corner and didn't like who I asked for help. After that, he would pretty much fight and harass every male I would talk to. Some would probably find this flattering, but I found it annoying and immature. I tried to tell him not to worry and that we were just friends, but his exact wording was, They don't deserve you. They are worthless compared to my master. I then yelled at him. I do feel bad because it was quite harsh, but I was about fed up with his bullshit, and if he wanted to act like a dog, I was going to treat him like one. I thought I was finally free from that cycle. He finally stopped following me around. Until one day, I found this letter in my locker. 
In this letter, my stalker gave his disgust for males and his hate for himself, and that he must be evil for his master to treat him this way, and that I must be taught not to shun pets. It was a few pages long, and it was very disturbing. In fact, it was the most terrifying thing I had ever read, especially when I got done reading it and looked up and saw him staring at me from down the hall. He came up to me and opened his phone and started showing me pictures of, well, of a cartoon character who had a similar appearance to me, with the same brown eyes and curly hair. Then, he tried to hand me a leash and asked me to walk him around. At that point, I ran away, up to the office, letter in hand. The principal finally had the proof he needed and agreed to step in. The cops got involved and soon after, a restraining order was put in place. He was expelled and wasn't allowed within 50 feet of me. About a month after that, I was sitting in my room one night, doing some homework, when I heard a scratch at the window. I looked over, and then froze in pure terror. My stalker was standing just outside my bedroom window. He had a collar around his neck, and a leash was dangling down from it. He was intensely glaring at me through the glass. His face then crooked into a disgusting grin before licking the surface of the window and ran off. I flipped out and woke my parents who called the police. When the cops showed up, I told them who it was and what he did. They collected the evidence from my window and arrested my stalker for breaking the restraining order. Thankfully, I moved out of that town a month later and I never heard from my stalker again. I still have nightmares about this to this day. Being stalked was not romantic or fun. It was terrifying, bone shaking, and nerve wracking, and the worst thing I have ever gone through. But I do hope that he got those issues worked out. This goes back to when I was 15 and a sophomore in high school. I had a few friends and would walk by myself to and from most of my classes because small talk made and still does make me nervous thanks to some anxiety issues. I was walking to class one day and this guy, we'll call him Creeper, came out of nowhere and started walking next to me. He was a bit too close for comfort so I moved over, but he followed. He was so close to me his arm was brushing against my shoulder. For context, I'm 5'1 and 93 pounds and this guy was at least 62, 180 pounds, and probably a year or two older. I had some bad experiences with strange men in the past, so I was getting pretty uneasy. He finally decided to introduce himself. Hey, you're Donna, right? Of course I was taken aback, since I had no clue who this dude was and had never seen him before. Do I know you? I asked. What he said next gave me chills and still creeps me out to this day. No, but I know you. Just like that, he turned and walked away. I kid you not, he actually said that. I saw him the next morning when I was sitting with my friends and waiting for the first bell to ring. I pointed him out to them and asked who he was. They didn't know him either. The bell rang and we all went our separate ways. I stuck my headphones in my ears and turned on some music for the walk to first period. I felt an arm brushing against my shoulder. I looked out of the corner of my eye and saw the creeper there, staring at me with this weird grin. I moved away from him, and just like before, he moved right with me. He pulled my headphones off and started asking me for my number. When I told him no, he started begging like he was trying to be cute. Please, can I have your number? You're so pretty. I just want to be able to call you. I said nothing. Then he started asking me if I had a boyfriend and if that was why I wouldn't talk to him. I got to my class and hurried in, and he stood by the door staring and grinning for a few seconds before he left. This went on for several weeks. He started turning up everywhere I went. I would even take detours to try and throw him off, but he eventually picked up on those as well. Every day he would ask if I had a boyfriend and if I would just give him my number. After telling him no multiple times, I eventually gave up and just started giving him the cold shoulder. One afternoon, I was walking to the bus parking lot to catch my ride home. Suddenly, my headphones were tugged out of my ears, and lo and behold, there's Creeper. 
You never gave me your number. He whined. I put my earbuds back in only to have them yanked out again. Why won't you give me your number? Come on, haven't I been nice to you? I hopped on my bus and thanked the gods he didn't follow. That night, I got a text message from an unknown number. It said, hey, with a winky face. I asked who it is, and soon after get the reply that it's Creeper, and he asked if I was a virgin. Now I'm sitting here thinking, how did he get my cell phone number? I did have a Facebook and a MySpace, but neither one of them had my email or phone number visible to anyone but my friends. The next morning I called the phone company and asked them to block his number so he couldn't contact me. The next day I was walking between the two buildings of the high school on my way to a midday class and he shows up again. Why aren't you answering your phone? Why won't you message me back? I told him I couldn't talk because I was going to be late for class and walked faster. He got up and raised his voice a bit. Why won't you answer my calls? I want you to be my girlfriend. I ignored him and I guess he was tired of that because he got really angry. He ran up behind me and grabbed the handle of my backpack and the hood of my jacket with the same hand and yanked me backwards. I reached forward and grabbed the handle of the heavy metal door of the next building. I was screaming at him at this point. Let me go! Just leave me alone, okay? He was still trying to pull me behind the building and I was about to lose my grip on the door handle when I guess he realized that I'd created a scene. He let go and nervously said something along the lines that he was just playing and to stop being so serious. After that, he would try to message me on Facebook once in a while, but I blocked him there too. Thankfully, I haven't heard from him since. In high school, I had a male best friend. It was a known fact that he was super into me and people would give me crap all the time for leading him on. Never once did I try to become romantically involved with him. Was not into him like that. So he starts intensely dating my best friend. They have a frighteningly abusive relationship for years. He physically harms her. And I hate him. Then we all move to the same city just by chance and she admits to me that she found a folder on his computer when they were dating that was just pictures of me from Facebook, I guess, just all in one folder. Then I randomly see him at a show in Brooklyn where he met my then boyfriend. Then he starts contacting me, had no idea he had my number still, but he would only text me at 4am, saying incoherent nonsense about how thick I was, using more vulgar terminology, and how he used to lust over me in high school, and how I almost ruined his relationship with my BFF because of my body and all sorts of gross and crude remarks. Then when I asked him to stop, he said he needed help because he had a drug problem and he was going to end his life if I didn't talk to him. This went on for a while. Not sure why I didn't block his number. I told him I would call the police, but I guess I was legitimately afraid he would hurt himself. Fast forward two years later, it's starting again. This time I live on the other side of the country. Same text at 4am, his time on the opposite coast, about me and how I defined his ideal woman. Gross and not flattering. I tell him to stop and I will block him and call the police. He begs me to not stop talking to him because he needs to talk to me. Legitimately afraid he's going to just show up on my street, wouldn't put it past him. My boyfriend is angry and wants to get involved. I'm almost to the point of letting my boyfriend text him just to make him stop. I blocked him on Facebook, then I instantly get an Instagram request. Enough is enough. What do you think I should do? I have never had the best of luck with guys. I appear to have poor taste when it comes to dating. After separating for good from my kid's father after five years, I was ready to just be myself. About three months of being a single mother, my neighbor approached me stating that a friend of his, Steve, would like to meet me. It didn't take long before he charmed his way into my life. The first six months were amazing, but he began to drink more and more, and each time he would get extremely agitated. He would start fights with random people, and even some of our friends. Slowly, our friends would stop coming around, knowing how Steve got when he drank. This, however, did not stop him from drinking. 
but now all the anger was aimed at me. It took roughly six to eight months of buildup, from name calling and shoving to punching and choking. Suddenly this became a very abusive relationship. One time I escaped out of the bathroom window. He later found me by beating up a friend of mine until he told him where I was. Steve began stripping all of my clothes off in a drunken rage while laughing at me and challenging me to go ahead and try to escape while I was naked. The last night of abuse was by far the worst. Before Steve started drinking that night, I told him that my son, three years old, was not feeling very well and I was going to stay with him as he fell asleep. My plan was to spend the night with my son. At around 2.30 in the morning, I heard the bedroom door open. I lied there pretending to be asleep. Several seconds went by. I held my breath as tears began to form in my eyes. When I suddenly felt his hand on top of my head, he grabbed my hair and yanked me out of bed, whispering in my ear, I know you're avoiding me. Once in the living room, he threw me on the floor, then accused me of trying to leave him and demanded to know why. Before I could answer, he angrily came to the conclusion that it was another man. I swear to God, if I catch you with another man, I'll kill you and him. He was obviously more drunk than normal. He punched and kicked me a couple of times, and I fell to the floor. I started to crawl to my son's room, and he slowly came from behind me, asking, Where do you think you're going? He then walked in front of me, kneeled down, and said, You stay right there or I'm gonna hurt you real bad. He then sat on the couch and watched me as I sobbed on the floor. After about 30 minutes, it appeared that he passed out on the couch. I decided that this was my chance to escape. I put on an oversized shirt, picked up my son, and slowly crept by him. He suddenly woke up and grabbed my leg and said, Where are you going? I stammered out that I was going into the kitchen with my son to get him a drink. He then angrily replied, Hurry up. As soon as I entered the kitchen, I ran out of the front door with no pants on, no shoes and no purse. I carried my son all the way to the police station which was thankfully only a few blocks away. After hours, the way the police station is set up is that you go into a room and press a button and talk to someone on the intercom. I ran in and put my back to the wall and pushed the button behind me as I slowly slid down into a sitting position while holding on to my son, waiting for Steve to burst through the door at any second. I remembered thinking if I was going to be beaten, at least it would be on camera. On the speaker, I heard... How can I help you? All I could do was cry. I couldn't even get a word out of my mouth. I didn't know how to explain. Two officers came out to assist me. A female officer took my son and got him some food, and I went with the male officer to make a report, and he gave me a blanket. After 15 minutes, I heard Steve screaming my name as they brought him down the hallway. I held my breath as if he knew I was behind the door. 30 minutes later, an officer came back with a sergeant. At first, I thought they were going to tell me to go back home and gather my belongings while Steve was being held in custody. Instead, they asked me more questions about his anger issues and if there had been any previous fights. I explained to them Steve's alcohol problem and how he had become increasingly more abusive. They then showed me a list in Steve's handwriting detailing how he would dismember my body in a good spot where I would be buried without being found. He also had possible dates written down with past dates crossed out. I couldn't breathe when I read this and by this point tears were streaming down my face. I looked at the cop and asked, what does this mean? He looked back at me and said, it means you're lucky. Steve was charged with attempted murder, kidnapping and assault. I left back home to Arizona before the trial started but gave a detailed statement before I left. Steve, of course, pled not guilty, but in the end, he received two years in prison. Just before I left for Arizona, I received a letter from Steve. It simply read, It's not over. You'll always be mine. I 
don't know if any of you guys remember a few years ago when a sort of killer clown craze shook America for a few months. Well, this all happened during that time. I always remembered me and my friends thought it was funny, and we'd always watch those clown caught on camera videos that were really popular at lunch. Although, our laughter turned into fear when we were made aware that a few of those clowns on Twitter threatened to come to our school at 11am that day and quote unquote kill all of us. Luckily, the school picked up on this, and they sent out emails to the parents that they had scheduled a planned lockdown at 10.30 that day in response to the threats. I was sitting in history class when I heard the familiar sound of the lockdown alarm, followed by the teacher rushing to the windows and door, locking and closing them. Even though initially the threat freaked me out, I wasn't worried at this point. I reasoned that it was most likely just another blank threat online, and that nothing would happen. After about 40 minutes of silence, sitting on the cold floor in the corner of the room, the emergency green flashing light turned off, then followed by the air conditioning, slowly falling silent, and then the hallway light switched off. The school had cut the power, but why though? At this point, me and my classmates were staring at each other. We all knew that something real was going on, as the school never cut off the power unless something serious was happening. After 10 minutes or so, we could all hear a faint banging noise from down the corridor, shortly followed by heavy and fast footsteps. Someone was running down the hallway. They started banging on the lockers and screaming. At this point, a few girls started quietly crying. Just then, the most terrifying thing ever happened. One of the men, dressed as a clown, ran up to the class door, banging and screaming. Multiple people were crying now and one of my friends whispered to me in complete seriousness saying we we're all gonna die. I have no shame in admitting that this caused me to start crying too. I then heard the loud sound of glass shattering. The man had shattered the glass part of the door, and I could see his arm reaching through to try to unlock the door from the inside. I was frozen and in complete disbelief as to what I was witnessing. But luckily, my teacher reacted quickly, grabbing a piece of shattered glass from the ground and stabbing the man's arm before he could unlock the door. He instantly grabbed his arm back, and you could hear his screams of pain. He then quickly stepped away from the door, and his screams slowly faded down the corridor. After another two hours, the principal came on the loudspeaker, explaining everything. He said that just after 11, two men walked into the school, one holding a kitchen knife. They ran around the school, threatening to kill students and trying to break into classrooms. But once the police raided the school, only one of them was caught, and it wasn't the one who tried to break into our classroom. After the whole event, the school got over 20 buses to take the younger kids home, and the kids 9th grade and over, like me, were told to walk home in groups and call the cops if we saw anything suspicious. I had a hard week at school after that experience. I was always thinking that the men would return, this time with a gun or something, but nothing happened. This, nonetheless, will be scarred into my mind forever. Ever since the lockdown, the school has hired a few more on-campus police officers, and they've installed some auto-locking features on doors and windows. This has made me feel a little bit better in school, but this isn't just an experience you can simply forget about.